Yo, 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 what up, chat? How's it going, guys? Hello, hello. Yo, Cowface, dude, thank you for the two months, man. Thank you for that resub. Ant, what's up, dude? CA Horn, Canhorn, can hello, hello. Thank you for the three months as well, man. What is up, everybody? How are we doing? Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Thank God, it's Friday. I was uh, ready for this week to be over. That's for sure. But what up? We're going to be working on some stuff today. Um, mostly, we're building a service from scratch today. So that's kind of exciting. We are we're going to be focused on building out the Discord notification worker. Um, <clears throat> I didn't do a whole bunch of work since last time we were here. Um, the only thing that I want to note and mention is the following. Which is, um, where is it? Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I want to note is <clears throat> last time we were streaming. <laughs> Thanks, Cowface, dude. Hang on. I got to stand up first. Cool. Okay, so last stream. What did we do last stream, chat? So last stream, remember, you can always go to the wiki, Alta 4 wiki, right? Um, if we look at the last stream, which was 413, we talk about automating quirk buckets. And the main reason why we automated quirk buckets last stream was because we were working on getting ready to build our new services. If you recall, we have been working on implementing a much higher level go live notifications technical document that we wrote um, like last week, I think, or something like that. So anyways, this document outlines everything that we want to achieve with regards to go live notifications. And remember, these go live notifications are like when we go live with Twitch, we want it to go out to Discord. We want it to fan out, essentially, and go to all the different connections that that we have. Um, and so we had to build some infrastructure before we could get there. If we look at our flowchart, our beautiful flowchart that we have here, let me see. There we go. It'll give you enough space. I guess I can zoom out a little bit, but yeah. Okay. So if we look at this flowchart, right, we know that either the streamer or you, the viewer will trigger some type of event, right? And that event gets propagated in Twitch services. And if it's something that Twitch says, hey, we want to relay to uh, anyone subscribed to this event, then they do so. So, for example, if somebody follows, if somebody goes, goes live, if somebody redeems a repu uh, re uh, reputation channel point thing, um, we get all of those events sent to us. Uh, sorry, I just want to make sure we were good. Uh, we get all of those events sent to us, right? So, for example, when we do change lights red, right? Lights change red, and that's all processed from a message sent by Twitch. Uh, so once we get that message, right, we immediately say, okay, well, we're going to drop this onto a Knative message broker, and then that message broker is going to trigger a revision and essentially send that message to the desired worker, depending on what worker we send it to. Now, last time we were streaming we talked about creating discord notification worker and twitter notification worker behind rabbit i decided not to do that um i decided to step away from that and keep for now at least everything as just a k-native uh real-time message i think the reason why for this at least is because i really do want to lead on k-native as much as possible uh, Knative does a really great job of handling real-time messaging, uh, being able to like wire up containers to make it really easy to bootstrap these services and stuff like that. So Knative is just like, it's, it's a good tool. It's a good tool. Um, and so, yeah, I think what I would rather do is, is I would rather reuse Knative as much as possible than reuse Rabbit. Because when I started thinking about it, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to have to create like multiple queues. And then I'm going to have to make sure that each one of those queues has authentication and like the, the the wiring of rabbit would just be more work than I really would want it to be. Um, yeah. And that so yeah, so K native, essentially K native, if you guys don't know, 
is a uh, open source, uh, basically serverless solution. Um, if you've ever, you know, ran cloud functions in the cloud before or wanted to say like, how could I make it so like, you know, I scale to zero by default is what they call it, a zero scale, a zero scale deployment. And then like when I get requests, right, then I want to, you know, scale out and add containers and grow, right? That's what they call uh, serverless essentially and zero scale deployment. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, Knative is a Kubernetes, uh, it's a Kubernetes thing. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a series of services that you deploy to Kubernetes and they do this essentially. Um, now I've told you guys a little bit about this with like brokers and stuff. So this is a much more like Ku or Knative uh, look to it, which is uh, whenever an event happens, right? An event here. This is this is our source of truth right here. Just focus on eventing right now. Whenever an event happens, this is what we call a source. Now, I want to be clear: source, brokers, triggers, service, revision, route, serving, eventing, any kind of technical document that you read, and it's like using a uh, an adjective or a descriptor of some type of some type that's like an abstract descriptor, right? So, for example, um, say you're reading some documentation, and it's like, oh yeah, you want to use a pipe. In your mind, you're going to immediately think like, oh, well, like a like a like a steel pipe. <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? Um, this is super common with engineering things, right? We use terms as things and ways to describe what they are kind of in a, in a way, but it's really just as, hey, this is this in this system. Now, <clears throat> in eventing, a source is really the uh, the first part of where an event comes from right it is the source of an event and if you've ever used queues before you've probably heard of like producers and consumers right this is kind of similar to that in a lot of ways yo what's up Orca? thank you for the 13 months man appreciate you how you doing hope you're feeling better by the way um so yeah so let's talk about the the process so whenever an event happens that source sends a message to the broker right now you'll notice here that there's like a cloud here that means that sources can be within eventing or they can go directly to brokers themselves and that's exactly what we do if we go back to our infrastructure here the api service just goes directly to the broker and it's like hey man i got some stuff i need you to do go ahead and process this for me so we take this route we don't have at least yet we don't have and we're about to do this we're actually about to do this which is kind of funny um but up until now we've really only had external sources that pinged brokers and then so forth and so on. Once you hit a broker, it goes to a trigger, right? Now you might ask yourself, why doesn't a broker just send it directly to a container? The, the abstractions that sit in front of these things essentially are used again as tools to get to the next step. Yo, inexpensive, what's up? How's it going? Hello, hello. Um, thank you for the follow, by the way. Um, you're not, oh dude, I'm sorry. I hope I hope you do feel better. Um, yeah, I, I know you've been like not great lately <laughs> so I'm not to dox too much but I, I do hope you feel better soon buddy um sending sending love your way my dude and yeah what's up man how's it going expensive how are you um okay so uh friday off so get to catch your stream hell yeah well hey man i hope i hope this will this is we're building a service from scratch today so if anything keep your eyes peeled to the screen my friend because this is exactly going to teach you some of the stuff that i think you've you've been interested in um <clears throat> so yeah so like I said, in eventing, brokers go to triggers. Now, triggers essentially are that. They're just something that triggers something else to happen. Um, there are two parts of Knative. There's eventing and then there's serving. You don't have to, you don't have to use both of these. Like if you just wanted to use eventing, you could. If you just wanted to use serving, you could. But they are designed to work together and we use both of them. Now, up until this point, Right, I've shown you a source or essentially, you know, something that hits a broker and then that goes to a trigger. We've not talked about containers or anything like that. We've basically just said, hey, I got a broker and I got a trigger. Great, fantastic. Well, what do we do with that? So once we have a trigger, we can then tell it what we want it to trigger, right? And that's this part right here, right? This is the URL. So when a trigger is fired by a broker from an a from a source right so source broker trigger that trigger has a configuration for a specific route in serving right or and again it doesn't this is what i mean by you don't have to use this this trigger could also hit a different url it doesn't have to hit 
a it could hit any url right that's the idea here but if you use it with serving you can send it to routes and these routes have revisions of container configurations and so essentially what happens is a source hits a broker a broker hits a configured trigger that trigger goes to its predetermined route which then checks to see if we have any latest revisions these revisions are containers essentially what is the latest image we're using what is the latest configuration it grabs that revision and then it starts the service now if the service is already started and say we're already getting trigger events right then it may scale the service right but if there are no events eventually it will scale this service down to zero and then it'll just sit as a revision again and that's how all of this works the reason why i really want to keep this is because I don't have to deal with things like authentication here. I don't have to deal with things like setting up queues. I don't have to deal with a lot of the more cumbersome and like annoying things. It allows me to keep it in real time, right? But because of the way we're designing it, it also makes it so that any other messages that come through event sub won't be blocked because we're sending it through back to the message broker and sending it to be processed by a different worker. Now, you know, again, this is something that like, if you, you know, were, I don't know, newer to a distributed systems design or, you know, weren't too sure on like, why aren't you just kind of processing it all in the same place? The biggest reason for that is, is because we want to let real time things happen as they're happening and then just kind of let them like diverge off, right? Um, if we get another event sub event for the worker, well, we've already diverged and created two new, uh, you know, two new messages for the notification worker for both Twitter and, and, uh, discord. We don't have to worry about this still being processing and doing things right. Like this is already done. Um, and so this is the revision I made, which is we are going to actually make it so that the event sub worker goes back to the broker and says, hey, broker, I need you to process a Discord notification and a Twitter notification. So this is going to be what we call uh, dog fooding. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard that phrase before, but it's essentially the idea that you're reusing things that you you built or you know, you, you, you've already got things that you know, are in place for you to easily just be like, all right, we'll just reuse this, right? And so that's really the case here is, is we have rabbit yes you know we were able to do what we were with the lighting but remember we did what we did with the lighting because we needed a queue system right here we don't actually really need a queue system this is still very much real time now there are some things to knative as well um for example you can do like knative -na uh dead letter so you can do things like dead letter queues and handling delivery failures I haven't dealt with this enough yet to know exactly how to work with this, but it is possible that you can do this. Now, what's funny is <laughs> it actually has a rabbit MQ broker under the hood that I've been aware of for a while. So there was another decision around this essentially saying at some point, K native may have direct integrations with rabbit, meaning that I would eventually be able to use a queue system with Knative directly because you can do that. You can embed Rabbit into it and do things like that um, and actually have a queue system on top of it. But we're not doing that yet. So we're not we're not super worried about that right now. Yo, I am Chets. What's up? How's it going? Hello. Hello. Dog what? Dog food. Dog food? Dog, am, I, am I saying that right? Dog? Wait, no. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But essentially, it's about reusing what you've already got. So, <laughs> dog fooding. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, it is dog food. Thank you. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I think I'm saying that right. <laughs> oh, Derek, how's it going? Hello, hello. But Quirk Service API is an EC2 instance. No, it's not. Every single one of these things that looks like a container is a container. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so this is a container. This is a container. 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 Service. And all of these can scale. All of these can scale. Scale. Let me let me catch up here. Let me catch up with chat here. Looks for clue stick. <laughs> I end up watching your vods if I miss any streams. Oh, dope. Well, again, I hope they've been helping, man. I really do. Um, is keeping their eyes glued to the screen. 
<laughs> uh, it's more likely to watch the VOD this uh, of this stream on repeat. Awesome. Well, I hope I hope it helps. Um, but yeah, no, everything is this. Everything in here is in running in Kubernetes, actually. Yeah. Um, I got a question. You can't really answer it because it's up to me, but I am thinking of ref I love that you said that. Uh, I am thinking of reformatting my game rig and setting up Arch with i3. I will lose access to a lot of games, but I find myself maybe. What do you think? I think you should put a VM on it and do exactly what I did so that you never, ever have to regret that you did it and that you can't go back. I genuinely believe that if you've got like a pretty good gaming rig, you should just get something to virtualize your, your Linux layer. Because then if you want to go play video games, you can, man. You know, that was my biggest thing. Like, I know how off. Nope. Nope. Dog, I'm using one right now. <laughs> yes, I'm using a VM. Oh, hey, guys. What's up? It's Windows. <laughs> I've been using. Did I just like blow your mind that I've been using a VM for like this whole time? <laughs> yeah, it's Arch. Exclamation mark Arch. <laughs> but why? Why? <laughs> uh, but why? Why not? What am I doing inside of the VM that would be labor intensive uh, outside of like CPU, right? Basically, what I decided a while ago was I was like, all right, why don't I put my concerns where I have them, right? I'm a gamer. I like being able to play video games. So uh, let's get a powerful gaming machine. Check. First thing I did. That's the biggest caveat. I have a very powerful rig. I have an i9900K. I have a 1080 or not a 1080 uh a 2080 ti like i have a very powerful very powerful gaming machine um now what that means is, is that i can do a lot of stuff with it i don't just have to be able to like like when i look at a computer this powerful i don't just go oh games like i, I look at it and i go like ooh vms ooh servers like ooh other things and so that was something that kind of hit me is I was like, you know, I could I, I could easily run a VM on this thing, man. Like I have, I literally have so much power on it. I could run multiple VMs and I do. As a matter of fact, what you guys probably don't realize is that if I go to my home tab, you'll see I'm running two VMs right now, actually. I'm running my, my Manjaro Hippo VM, which is for all of my work stuff. And then I'm running my personal VM for all of my personal stuff. So you guys right here, are seeing my personal VM, but I actually have another VM over here. That is my work, uh, my work VM. Yo, Tim, how's it going, man? Tim and his turtles. How you doing, buddy? It's been a while since we've seen you and your turtles. How you doing, buddy? Welcome everybody from Timbo Dad's stream. How are you, sir? Thank you for the raid. What were you up to, man? How's everything in your side of the world? Thank you again for the raid. And yeah, shout out to Tim. If you guys haven't checked him out, he's an awesome game developer, works on really cool stuff, completely on his own, which is amazing. Very difficult as well. Be sure to check him out. There we go. I tend to do 12 hour streams these days. Dang, that's, those are long, bud. <laughs> Well, how, I, I hope everything's been good. I hope the streams have been well. I hope the game development's been good too. Makes sense when you have multiple monitors. Yeah, yeah. So everyone just tuning in. Hello, I am Black Glasses. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Alta 4 stream. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Uh, TLDR on me, I'm a DevOps engineer. Uh, I've, I've been a uh, system, well, not a systems, but a software engineer for 10 years. Um, and the past five of those years, I've been focused on DevOps. Um, today, I am working on our uh, platform that we've actually been building for about two years now. It's called Quirk. Uh, basically, it is a stream tools platform. Uh, if you know something like Stream Elements or Streamlabs, uh, yeah, those are basically uh, our competitors. <laughs> um, we we're trying to focus on building something that really was something that we needed. You know, I've used a lot of those other tools and like they've, they've only gone so far. I've only been able to get so, you know, mileage may vary essentially. And a while ago when I started realizing like, what would I want to do on stream? I started realizing, well, maybe I should just start solving my own problems on stream, which is a big thing we, w of what we do here. Again, I'm a DevOps engineer, so it's kind of part of my, my trade. Um, but yeah, we, we build, you know, uh, products and, and services and, and uh, all these other things essentially to help 
uh, with our stream. So as you saw, we have lights changing. Uh, we have our bot responding. All of those things are integrations within uh, within the project that we've been working on called Quirk. So today, um, I'm actually working on bringing some of it back to life. Um, I did a migration a while ago. If you if you guys haven't, by the way, seen it, uh, if you go to our YouTube, the first one, um, you will see that we have a playlist there for a migration to Azure. Um, about eight months ago, I think, we did a pretty big migration to Azure. Um, and when we did this migration, we moved a lot of stuff. We broke a lot of stuff purposely, um, but we had to then later on fix those things. Uh, and so that's what we're doing now. We're going back and fixing them. And what we're fixing right now is, is we're fixing the go live notification. So whenever somebody uh, goes live, like Tim or I, we would go live. Uh, there's a message that's sent in from Twitch through their backend. And as a matter of fact, you can see it here in this flow chart that I've made, uh, where essentially if you're the streamer, right, you go live, that message gets sent to Twitch services. Twitch will then say, oh, okay, cool. I've got to go ahead and process this and send this off to us. They send it to us as a message. Um, and then we process it with one of our workers. And so we're creating a new worker today in TypeScript. We're creating two workers, hopefully if we can. Uh, but yeah, our goals are to create our new Discord notification worker and our Twitter notification worker. But thank you guys. Seriously, thank you so much for the raid, man. I appreciate it. Worked on an animation system for custom engine C++ OpenGL. Dude, that's crazy. I, I really do want to learn how to do more game development. I, I've never delved into it. I, 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 I've, I have a little bit, like a not enough to say that I've done anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I actually, I got really fascinated by VR development for a while. I thought it was really interesting. Um, enough to where I was like, I'll get a headset. And I did, but didn't go didn't go very far outside of that um game dev as a whole other like yeah it is it no it is i i actually agree with that by the way yo uh oh geez i forgot how to say your name uh <laughs> i'm gonna call you dev uh 100 bits dude thank you for the 100 bits you i think you actually bugged out the lights change because it just stayed there <laughs> um so we got it liquid metal thank you for the follow by the way um, so yeah, uh, going back really quickly before you, you rated Tim, uh, we were talking about development machines. Now, like I, I was saying earlier, I work in DevOps. A big thing of what I do is focused on making my development experience, uh, easier, nicer, you know, more enjoyable. And, um, also if you don't know, I created a YouTube video. I created, it sounds like I made like, like I, like I wrote a novel. Uh, I made a YouTube video, uh, basically on how I automated my, my whole development environment because so much of what I do, I like to automate. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really, um, I wanted to make sure that I could do every, like I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. Real talk. I, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. And so, um, you know, I, I focus on doing a lot of stuff in Linux. I need like a Linux kernel. I want to be able to use Linux like as powerfully as Linux is, um, but I don't want to lose being able to game, right? And so, as I said before, you know, I do have a very powerful machine. I have an i9 900K. I have a 2080 Ti. Like again, it's got it's got some oom pow pow. Um, and so because of that, um, I can run a VM. Now I run a VM for all of my development stuff. Right, I don't run my games in the VM. And as a matter of fact, when I'm gaming, I normally shut down the VMs just because there's really no need for them to be running anyways. It's not what, I've, what I'm focusing on. But, you know, anybody who's ever watched, you know, the stream in the past at least nine months, you have, you have, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. No worries. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, I'll see you in a second. Um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what, was I, what was I saying? Um, oh, uh, yeah, no, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. So yeah, so the VM manager I use is called uh, VM Workstation. I've tried other things in the past. Um, I've used um, Parallels. I've used uh, Hyper-V. I've used um what's the other one what's the other one what's the other one it's called it's terrible what's the other one that like everyone knows and everyone uses what's the what no no it's okay it's okay uh what was that what was uh what's the what's the one that everyone uses virtual box yeah virtual box <laughs> yeah gosh i hate virtual box it's so bad um yeah i've used virtual box i've used kvm um it, like hands down through and through um i i you have to spend money on it you have to spend money on it. I totally get it. And you know, it's like $299 or something like that. Like it's, it's, it's not cheap. 
but I do believe hands down that it is the best desktop hypervisor that you can buy. Um, and that's just my personal, that's my personal opinion. I've used it for years now. Um, they do a great job of like integrating all of their other services into VM workstation as well. Um, and here's something that will kind of blow your mind. Um, because I develop in a VM, um, I'm able to bring that VM anywhere. So technically I can, if I have VM fusion on my MacBook, I can take my VM and run it on my MacBook and still have Linux. I love being able to do that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I can, I can. The, the idea is, is that as long as VMware, you know, can run my hype, my, my VM, then I can run my VM anywhere. And so they do have VMware fusion as well, which is another hypervisor for Mac. And I do have a Mac laptop as well. Um, so it just makes my, my dev environment really portable. You know, uh, I can back up the VM as well. Like I could just, you know, if I'm worried about backing up my virtual machine, I could just make a copy of it and I'm done. I don't have to like worry about, you know, making backups and file. Like it's one file. <laughs> it's the drive file. Well, you know, it's a few files, but you get the idea. Um, what's wrong with VirtualBox? Nothing, honestly. It, it was it was a really cool product that got open sourced because of Oracle. I think that's what happened. And it just kind of like never got 2020 love, like not 2020 love, but like new year love. Like, you know, it's 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 just it's the same terrible user interface and the same like limited functionality of things like not that you can't do a lot of stuff with VirtualBox. It's just like, do you want to? <laughs> do you really want to? Um, somebody asked me if I do GPU pass through. No, but I do use GPU acceleration. So that is one thing to notice is I do have GPU acceleration. Yeah. Just a question. If you were building your infrastructure today, would your choice of bare metal hypervisor change or remain the same? Oh, gosh. Do I have money or am I broke? <laughs> that would be that would be my next question. Stares at virtual box icon on the desktop. Listen, it's not like I, I poop on virtual box just because I've used it. I've fought with it. It's annoying. And like I can literally say everything and reason why I don't like it. It's if it works for you, then it totally is fine. Like through and through, I will be like, dude, yeah, that's great. Like I, I can't argue that. Um, but when we talk about my own experience, performance, things like that, uh, VirtualBox has always come second to uh, what's it called? Um, VMware. Yeah, VMware. I just think they make a really good product. I think they make a really good product. Uh, hold on one second. Let me go make sure my front door is unlocked. So, dear second. All right. Sorry about that. It's funny because you just redid your infrastructure. I mean, yeah, I did it. I re but see, we did it from like we redid it from like a software, you know, a software perspective. We didn't really change it much from a heart. Well, we did a little bit, but we did it within our means, man. Like we couldn't go out and just buy like <laughs> like five thousand dollar systems. You know what I mean? Like it was more like, oh, hey. I have an SSD in these two systems over here. And if I unplug this one and put it in this one, then I can get another one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 We did change the hypervisor. We did. Yeah. We went to VMware, uh, which is another reason why it was really nice is because when we moved to VMware, if you guys don't know, uh, here, let me show you what a, let me, let me show you what an on-prem cloud looks like. Well, this is the login to an on-prem cloud. Um, so we do have our own data center here, um, in the garage. Uh, that's why we call it garage. Um, but this is essentially a uh, six node cluster at the moment, which will probably grow eventually to more. Um, oh, this song's such a banger. I love this song. I love it when they play this song. Thank you. Thank you for this song. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, right now we basically have six hosts. We have three, eight core, 32 gig RAM nodes. And then, ooh. Uh, and then we, sorry. And then we have, uh, three 24 core, 96 gig Ram, no servers. Um, and so obviously the 24 cores are what are show us cores. You, you look, Oh, you can't see it. My bad. 
Um, so here's the funny part about it. It's a hundred cores. It's a hundred cores. Um, they don't show it to you in um, cores. They show it to you in gigahertz, right? And how much active gigahertz you're using essentially. Um, oh yeah, no, I really liked the song. It's a good song. Um, and so you can see here that we have, we're using 13 gigahertz of the moment, uh, out of the, you know, VMs you see here running right now. And remember we have a whole Kubernetes cluster running. We have multiple like Samba network, uh, NFS shares running. Uh, we have circle CI runners running. So it's not, you know, not idle. It's got stuff running on it. Um, and so this is running at 13 gigahertz right now out of 141 capacity. Um, we've got 127 free. So we still got some oom pow pow, you know, we could, we could kick it up. You know, when people ask me, when people ask me like, is quirk got, you know, the power of TypeScript? Yes. <laughs> yeah. We got about 141 gigahertz of power. Yeah. We're good. We're good. Uh, go to first tab. The cluster shows the course. Oh, okay. Wait, what? I don't want to like dox myself though. Like, I don't want to accidentally show something. Um, go to the first tab. The cluster shows the course. I'm not going to like show like total processors. Where is that? Wait, what? This is the what? total processors. I just don't want to like show show like a license or something by accident because I know that there are some of these on these screens. <laughs> That'd be bad. Uh, it was at the top. Wait, what? No, forty eight. No. It. No. This isn't right. There's no way it's just forty eight. We have two twenty four cores alone. <laughs> Is this including or is this excluding vSAN? Because if it's excluding vSAN, then that's why we're missing about might not be counting. You need to be doing something. You need a doing something secret screen. Oh, do I? Hold on. <laughs> pause. Pause for effect and Wi-Fi connectivity. Hold on. Hodl. Hold. You mean this? Uh, running vSAN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wrong. Okay. I was like, I, this, this is wrong. <laughs> Mine shows the wrong number. <laughs> yeah. Uh, effing love the stream. I always learned something, uh, uh, I wanted to learn. Oh, thanks, man. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Individual hosts show more. Yeah. Well, anyways, it's a hundred cores. It's a hundred cores. Yeah. Uh, like that one you just need one of those yeah exactly yeah so you can see like here's all of our systems in the whole rack essentially um the main hosts and then a bunch of vms here we don't have all of them running like we used to be running game servers and stuff but we turned them off because nobody was using them um <laughs> thank you uh and so yeah but this is this is our this is our data center this is our on-prem data center essentially um, yo, Fargo, thank you for the follow. Uh, and so just to give a little bit more context, if we go back to actually, if we go back to this really quickly, so we have 141 gigahertz of oom pow pow. We have 319 gigabytes of Ram. Um, and we're only using 177 right now. Now this is, this is cached and also allocated. So this doesn't mean that this is actual, If you know, what actual memory means. It means what you've actually used versus cache and stuff, but it means that this has just been provisioned. It, we can't go beyond this, right? So realistically, it's probably more like around here or something right now. I don't, we don't use a lot of memory. Um, and then the storage, we've got 5.4 terabytes used of highly available replicated storage uh, across 14 terabytes of uh, actual space. Um, so yeah, so what we're gonna be doing is, is we're gonna be creating um, a container that's gonna run inside it. Like, it's so funny because when you look at a Kubernetes cluster from like here, <laughs> it looks, you know, it looks like there's just tons of stuff. Like, you know, there's this long endless list of processes and stuff, but it's, it really is like kind of like a uh, universe, like, you know, our universe and how it works where you see this scale, but then you scale out and then you see everything that's running inside of them, which is all of these Kubernetes nodes right here. So right now we're using 12 gigahertz for just the Kubernetes cluster. We're using 14 gigs of memory just for the Kubernetes cluster and about 1.52 terabytes just for the Kubernetes cluster. And this is 
the reason why I can do this is because, again, what's nice about VMware is like they've got really nice logical scoping where you can like put stuff in folders. So I was like, I wonder how much the system is using. Well, if the whole Kubernetes cluster is using 12 gig or 12 gigahertz, I can see, oh, the system's only using 2.3 and it's using three gigs. So honestly, the system is actually only using about as much as one, uh, one server right 2.3 gigahertz 3.2 gigs of ram that's that's not a lot but if we go to the workers yeah this is where but this is this is good this is actually really good this means that we're not allocating stuff to our our system nodes and our workers are doing the job that they should be doing so and it's actually scaling really nicely um in, in a lot of ways that like the memory is low the gigahertz can be nice and burstful and stuff like that um but yeah no i mean vms are powerful man and I really do enjoy, I really do enjoy being able to dev in a VM and then, you know, move that VM if I need to. And um, one thing I haven't talked about technically that I could do with VMware that I, I haven't really, I haven't really done yet is like I could run VMs in the cloud and connect to them via this hypervisor and run them through the data center. <laughs> um, the performance would not be anywhere near as good as it's running on my host, but it is possible. So, yeah. Um, it is total physical cores, not including hyperthreading. Might not be counting the vSAN. I have 72. I don't think it, yeah, I don't, even without that, it doesn't matter because it's still not counting the vSAN. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Um, yo, come on. What's up? How's it going? Uh, I like the idea of VMing my productivity. It'll be, it'll, it'll be like a login to work sort of. That's exactly what I, no, that's what exactly, that's exactly what it is for me. 100% when I start my work day, I start my VMs. And then when I end my work day, I shut down my VM. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you could try a headless. Uh, I, I will say I tried WSL and, um, unfortunately it just, you know, again, mileage may vary. Um, I liked it. I really did. But I like, I, you know, again, I started falling in love with working with NeoVim and like having I3 and being able to do all these other things. And so for me, it really became like, I just want a whole Linux environment. You know, it, it wasn't even about you know, being able to shove most of the things I do in a VM or in a, you know, CLI at that point, it's more like, you know, whatever may, may also be kind of, uh, may also be up. So here's the thing, Aramis, and I'm going to be very clear to every single person sitting here right now. I'm going to debunk right now. I'm going to debunk a very common misconception with current, and I'm going to say current processors and virtualization. You can give the literal VM all of the cores of your computer if you want you can do that you 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 can do that right the thing that you have to be a, and, and here's the thing when you do that the virtualization technology today should be as good to where you don't even see a difference between the two right virtualization at a very low level is really meant to be as seamless feeling as possible Right. And so in the scenario where like you're running Linux, it, you really want your Linux VM to feel almost identically to how it would feel in, you know, the host itself, not running on that VM. So if you're running like a newer processor and stuff like that, you're probably you probably got VTX. You've probably got VHX. Is it VHX? I think. But like you've probably got these new extensions and other things that allow you to really lean on the power of like hyper threading and other things like that. And that's why like earlier when Orca was saying, you know, uh, that's your count. And I was like, no, that can't be my count. It's just because it depends on how you look at it. You could be looking at it as physical cores. You could be looking at it as hyper threading, which is basically times two. Um, but at the end of the day, um, these all have capabilities of, of virtualization that make it so that it's very seamless. Um, if you're running on a newer system, right? Like an I7 or above, you can more than likely give that VM at least 75% of your overall CPU um, and you'll be fine, right? Now, what does that mean? That means that you don't open up games and start compiling code at the same time. <laughs> don't do that. That is a bad idea. That is something I don't do. Um, when I, when I'm, when I'm developing, I, I close my work VM, you know, when I'm, or I'm sorry, when I'm, when I'm gaming, I close my development VM, you know, when I'm, when I'm not gaming, I, you know, I turn on the VM. So if you build a workflow that works for you as well, then you really don't have to be worried too much about like, Oh, well, am I going to run out of memory or not? it's like, no, you're doing all the stuff you need to. And then once you shut down the VM, it's you're done. 
So no crisis while waiting for Bill. Probably not. But here's the thing. You wouldn't have been able to do that anyways. And that's my point. <laughs> Whether if it was in a VM or not, you trying to run a crisis build <laughs> or trying to run crisis while you're building software was probably just never a good idea. <laughs> uh, how do you handle data storage separation in the VMs versus the host? I don't. Um, so I do have, uh, I guess the things I can say is, is I do have, um, integration that allows me to like copy paste from host to VM, right? That's what we call open VM tools. Um, and so that integrates with the virtual machine so that like, if I wanted to, you know, copy something outside of the VM, like a text of some sort, and then paste it in the VM, I can do that easily. Like, as a matter of fact, I can copy from one VM. Look, I'm going to copy crisis and then I should... Actually, I don't know what's in the, <laughs> I don't know what's in the, the, uh, the, the, what's it called here? Hold on. Okay. Sorry. I didn't know it was in my history, so I wasn't sure, but I actually copied crisis from one VM, like a completely different VM, right? To another VM. And so you can't like, you can have that level of seamlessness and you can even drag and drop like I can if I wanted to, like I could go here and be like drag and drop into the VM. Um, but I don't do any type of folder sharing or anything like that. Here's the reason why. When you do like mounts through VMs and stuff like that, it's very groggy. It's very slow. And the reason for it is, is because it's trying to translate that data from your VM to your host. And it's got to just go through a whole bunch of hoops to do it. It's not performant at all. And normally you end up using something like Fuse or some really just janky approach that's never good. Um, my recommendation for handling your files is automate all the things. Watch my YouTube video. I'm not even kidding. Um, I solved that problem by automating everything. Um, I, I made it so that, you know, if I need to make a change, it's, you know, it's in automation somehow. Or if I need to, you know, uh, move files somewhere it's you know it's it's available to in, in a repository right that I can easily just push up or you know or if I really 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 need to and this is this is something I haven't said on this stream but I've, I've mentioned before my VM actually runs on a on, a, on an external hard drive so if we go to my system my VM is actually on an Extreme Pro SanDisk, Extreme Pro, a two terabyte SanDisk Extreme Pro. The reason why is, is because I have all of my virtual machines on this. The reason why is, is because this makes my virtual machines completely portable. So when you ask me the question, how do I manage my data, right? At the end of the day, I don't really have to. All I have to do is manage my wherever my VMs are, right? And so I can easily, you know, unplug my hard drive, go somewhere else, plug it in. Um, it doesn't matter. Like my files are always with me um, because of this that I did here, which was making it so that my VM actually runs on a portable hard drive. So yeah, I don't, I don't really actually have to be worried about not having those files because I technically always have the, the operating system. <laughs> I think that's an extreme pro. What? What are you trying to copy me or not copy me? What are you trying to correct me on now, Orca? What, what do you, what, what do you, you, you must be feeling good enough to correct me on crap. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you. Been wondering about this. Uh, you said extreme pro four to, uh, times in the same sentence. Yeah. You must be feeling better, bud. <laughs> just give me crap. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, of course. No worries. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be real. Eventually I'll make a YouTube video on it so that you guys are understanding uh, so that you guys can like do it yourself. Um, the first part in this process was really doing the dot files. Like eventually you will be able to go to YouTube and redo everything. Like you'll be able to do the VM. You'll be able to, you know, do the external hard drive thing. Like all of those will eventually be videos for you guys. So don't worry about it. It's coming. It's coming. Okay, so we're like an hour into the stream and I haven't written a single line of code yet. So why don't we do that? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so like I said before, um, we're building a new service. We're going to build this service in TypeScript um, and we're going to make sure that this service is integrated with Knative running on Kubernetes and all of that good stuff. Now, I have gone ahead and already created the repositories 
Um, but if we go to Pulumi GitHub, remember where we do all of our what chat? Our what chat? Our automation. Right, right. Exactly. You guys are so smart. I appreciate it. Um, and so if you see here, uh, you'll see that we've got like uh, a Pulumi machine user. Now, oh, this is the thing I wanted to mention. Last stream, if you go to our wiki, last stream here, here's the wiki, right? Don't forget the wiki. If you go to our wiki, we started implementing, uh, we started implementing like our buckets and stuff like that for our go live notifications. In this implementation itself, the technical document, um, we talked a bit about, or I'm sorry, not this, uh, in, in the stream the other day, we talked a bit about like, we need to be able to give IAM credentials and S3 bucket access and, and, and then create like service repositories and stuff like that. Um, what is this built? Uh, it's built with discourse. Oh my gosh, stop. <laughs> I did that twice. Um, so I was able to create the buckets, right? We created a, a repository called Quirk, uh, Quirk Pulumi Bucket, right? And in this automation repository, we basically just handle the creation of buckets. And so if we go to bucket service, we can see that service buckets, One of we have one service bucket for Twitch preview. And then I believe if we go to, please tell me I'm logged in. Please tell me, dang it. Discourse though, yeah. Hang on chat, give me a second. Like for example, my two-factor authentication app, I run that on my host. So I just minimize really quickly, copy outside and then paste it in the machine. Stop putting me in Virginia. Stop it, okay? Amazon, I, I'm, I'm not in Virginia. I don't have any flipping services in Virginia. <laughs> Quit putting me in Virginia. Okay, so if we go to S3, And I zoom in a little bit for you guys. You'll now see that we have two new buckets, right? Our Quirk Dev Twitch Preview and our Quirk Prod Twitch Preview bucket. So these were created with the automation that we have here, right? So once we had that, I had to then think about how do we give credentials? Where'd we go? Here we go. Wait, what? Here we are. Yeah. Credentials, right? So remember, whenever you're, you know, creating something in the cloud, like Amazon, Google, whatever, you have to be able to authenticate with them in some way, shape or form to access those resources, right? So if you want to create a storage bucket or something like that, you know, you need to, you know, either A, be inside of their systems and use IAM roles and things like that, or you can create like IAM credentials, which is a much more common approach. And you generate like a key and an access ID, and then you you connect via that. And so that's that's really what we, we wanted to do is, is we wanted to, create IAM credentials for our Kubernetes cluster for each service so that each service could then access what it needs to like buckets and so forth and so on. And so when I first tried this in our stream before, and I think, I think I, I think I like show it somewhere in here. I don't know exactly where, but in this stream, I created the two repositories. Now, when I first created the repository, I created a repository for machine users in Quirk. And then I also made a uh, repository for um, uh, machine users in the organization. So I had two machine user repositories, one for the org level stuff and then one for Quirk. And I realized that that was bad, at least in the sense that we didn't need one for Quirk. And the reason is, is because remember chat, we create a domain, uh, you know, specific language or DSL or configuration, whatever you want to call it for our services. Um, and the reason why we do that is, is because if, for example, I want to give a service, a machine user, it makes more sense for me to add it to the DSL or the configuration like this, rather than go and managing it in the repository. And so this is something I really wanted to show you as well is, is like, remember we standardized all of our services. If we go to source, you'll see bot, backend, bot, cron, frontend, persistence, worker. These are all of our tiers, 
right? And each one of these tiers have services inside of it. API, LiveX, PubSub, WebSocket, Bot, Twitch, Discord, right? Cron, calendar notification, event subscription. All of these are completely organized and have categories and resources provisioned for them. So where all we need to do is give it a, you know, a configuration like this, and then it'll know how to provision the service for us. And again, that's why we've got things like migrate in here, machine user, the name of the service, right? API, is it private? Is it public, right? Things like that. Now, this is all our own custom configuration, our own custom logic that wraps around our automation. So these, these options are determined by us. And so this made me realize, oh, okay, what we really want to do is we want to make it so that these are just easily configurable on the services and not something I'm managing in like another repository, right? So the big takeaway here, chat, is I was able to solve this by dog fooding the, in, the original, you know, uh, service types and service definitions rather than creating a whole new repository and then like having to go to that repository every time and be like, oh, I need a new user, da, 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 you know? Are you like the only Twitch streamer that does DevOps related streams? Rarely see anyone else doing them. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean, there are some people who do them, but there's two things about DevOps that's challenging. The first one is not many people even know how to do it right. <laughs> um, and you know, that's, that's, you know, that's tough. Um, and the second one is, is not many people are doing it, you know, um, it's not a very common job. Um, so I understand it, but no, I, I really am, uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways, the only person who, uh, who is, uh, but there are other people. It's not just me. Yeah. There's a uh, mastermind, for example, he's a fantastic streamer. He does DevOps. Um, Melky has actually been doing a lot more DevOps lately because of his job at Twitch um who else um there's a guy named techno tim i believe but he's a youtuber i i think he's more of a youtuber than a, a twitch streamer um yeah yeah there you go yeah 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 you, you found gold yeah yeah <laughs> thanks yeah techno tim but i've never yeah exactly i think he's a youtube streamer yeah only bg does it right <laughs> thanks buddy i appreciate that so is quirk reputation reset it is yeah it's it, it is and people are like already have you got have you seen the the, the scale Pew. yeah people have already redeemed up to a hundred thousand points sadis came in and was just like oh reputations work 10 10 10 10 <laughs> i was just like oh wow okay um so we've done this and as a matter of fact i showed you that we created our credentials here or our uh our buckets right quirk dev preview prod preview now we can also go to our uh give me one second and i'll do that we can go to our i am section and then users and then if we go to users look at this now I'm pretty proud of this. I am going to say, yo, uh, CK Darby, thank you so much for the prime. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, dang. I got to do a monkey type. That's right. And you guys are flipping my lights out. Hold on. Uh, I'm actually uh, uh, text this guy. Oh, oh, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Thank you for the Bezos Buckies. Thank you. You didn't have to give that to us. But you went in, signed on another account and gave it to us. Thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. Thank you. Um, so I want you guys to note this really quickly as well while you guys are spamming the literal out of my lights um <laughs> which is these are all machine users obviously except for me um and so if we look at this you'll see like alta 4 circle ci that's the circle ci you know user alta 4 pulumi that's the pulumi stuff recording pipeline terraform so this is the other thing that i did which is i went back and i said okay i want to standardize like how we name machine users yo td roke with the 10k as well oh my gosh orca did you just do 20k oh man i can't this 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 year this one's gonna be a this this one's gonna be a banger for sure <laughs> uh so many people have so many points that they can easily redeem right now it's it's kind of crazy um maybe oh my gosh thirty thousand. okay okay uh okay so yeah like i said we were able to refactor our users so that they have like proper naming conventions and things like that so at this point, I should be able to uh, create, start creating the service and, and doing all that stuff. But we have all the dependencies that we need in place to be able to do so. Uh, dang, Orca just got ranked two. <laughs> uh, 
That's crazy. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're going to start by... Um, actually, hold on. Before I start, you guys are like really distracting. <laughs> uh, see as well with another 10K. The pledges. I love it. The pledges. Someone is going to take rake two for me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions before we start creating this service on... You know what i just went over uh what we needed before we could start creating the service right we needed the repository we needed the bucket we needed the credentials right um we needed to make sure everything was set in place did you guys like break this one how did you guys like stick me in red light mode <laughs> um so yeah um we we wanted we wanted all that st stuff set up so that once we finished we were then able to uh we were then able to um start building our service right Green light, red light. Yeah, I think you like bugged it somehow. What? What is going on? I don't think you overloaded Quirk. I think you overloaded Twitch. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this is Quirk. Yeah, see? It's coming. <laughs> They're rate limiting it. Thank you for the 5K and the the allegiance pledge. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we need code in our life. Yep, yep, yep. I got you. I got you. Okay, cool. Fantastic. All right. So let's go ahead and clone our brand new repository. So this is going to be the first step of creating a fresh service. Um, as a matter of fact, hold on. Let me do one other thing really quickly. Sorry, 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 sorry. I need to create our notes for today. Um, and so what is today's date? Zero four. 15 2022 and today's agenda is going to be uh creating a quirk worker uh we need to create our quirk uh worker discord notification service uh that will provide handling messages or go live notifications from Twitch event sub. Um, okay, so I need to fix my, <laughs> it doesn't even know what I said. Okay, notifications from Twitch. So we're gonna be creating a worker. Uh, we need to take the following steps to verify we have everything we need which we just did right we check for repository right repository right which we did done uh then we check for uh environment specific s3 bucket which we did done right check for environment specific I am credentials done and I think that's it right those were the only things uh, and say uh, now that we have everything we need we can start by bootstrapping right bootstrapping the service uh, service logic right and so we're gonna do that now okay so I created a brand new repository or a brand new clone here quirk worker discord notification right so let's go to that so we're going to say quirk worker discord notification as a matter of fact you'll notice that we've got a bit of a uh, a pattern here right like quirk back in quirk back in quirk bot quirk cron quirk docker palumi and then you'll see here we've got a bunch of workers and this is this isn't a this is a design that we want we really want a few back ends right that do a few things and then just a bunch of workers that just go off and and fire these things yo pookie what's up how's it going <laughs> enjoy i mean you know i may have like spent a whole bunch of time building it so that you could do that so yeah enjoy it um okay so what we need to do now is we need to go to our quirk worker discord notification and what i'm gonna do is i'm going to literally copy everything from the discord command folder now the reason for that is is because this worker in almost every way is identical in how it's set up and i'll show you how it's set up after all the files are copied 
Um, so again, we're just copying, making sure that we've got like our Docker ignore moved over, um, all of our other files. But again, I'm really just making sure right now that I've got all of these other, you know, these, these files that were in this other, uh, in this other repository. Now let's look at it. Um, and as a matter of fact, let's, let's go look at it with, uh, well, let's look at it with NeoVim. Sure. Why not? Um, so if we look at the folder structure here of what I copied, we'll get rid of node modules. Yes. Get rid of node module. Wait, what? Yes, get rid of it. Okay. Uh, so we have our Git repository, right? That is for our new repository, right? So that that is that was from the clone, right? We also have a source directory. In this source directory, we have a bunch of files that already exist, like command type. And these are really the like meat of the service, right? This is the logic of like what it does and, and everything. We don't need most of this. So we can get rid of these things. So like command type, we don't need, um, we don't need ARGV. We don't need, no, actually, do we need event? Now, here's the thing. This handles the scaffolding of the event for us. So we're going to keep this because we're going to, we'll, we'll refactor that later. Uh, kube context, we're going to need uh, route, uh, route. Yeah, route we're going to need and service we're going to need. So most of these other things we're going to need. Everything else we pretty much can get rid of. Um, so let's keep moving forward. Now, again, the source, source directory, basically where you put, where I put all of my source code. So if you're asking like, how does BG structure his source data or his source files? That's really how I put everything in a source folder. And I normally just follow that methodology of like a source folder. Um, the next thing that we want to do is, is we want to make sure that like all of these root level files are set up. The first thing is we're going to want to make sure that the package.json is set up, right? So we're going to say, this needs to become discord notification the numbers right the authors right the build scripts are right as a matter of fact except for we don't need this anymore we can do this uh starts right that's right testing's right all of this stuff looks good oh you want me to okay why thank you Ooh, we got a good song Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Nice and comfy. Okay, all right. So what do we need? Um, we don't need Commander. We can get rid of that. We need Cloud Events. We don't need Discord JS. We need the GraphQL stuff. Um, we potentially need Redis, so we'll keep that for now. Well, yeah, we'll keep. Yes, we're gonna need Redis actually. Yeah, we'll keep Redis for now. JSON Web Token. I don't think we have any need for JSON web token. Koa, we're going to need. Lodash, we don't need. Moment, we don't need. We don't need. Request, we don't need. TS node, we need. TypeScript, we need. UUID, we don't need. Uh, we might need UUID, actually. Um, IO Redis, we need. Types JSON web token, we don't need. The node stuff, we don't need. React promise native, we don't need. Copy files, we don't need. And delete CLI, we don't need. Fantastic. Okay, so what have we done? What have we done, chat? Well. We essentially, if you were doing this from scratch, we created a source directory and a couple of files that we would need, like the entry point to our application and files that will handle specific pieces of code for us. But really, you don't have to worry about any of that. We just created a source directory. The next thing that we did is we created a package.json. Um, and so in this package.json, uh, we updated it from the one before where it's now quirk worker discord notification. We removed a lot of like the um, the packages we don't need and stuff like that. Um, and so we, we really just set up the package.json now, right? Um, so before I do anything else, I'm going to do an NCU really quickly to see if there's anything that I can update. And sure enough, there is. So we're going to just do an NCU dash U and that will make sure that everything, oh, dude, I love music like this. Just like really like trancey kind of music. I, I really do. Um, so if we go back to package, like I can write code, I can write immaculate code for hours listening to this type of music. And I'll probably just end up dying because I won't eat or something, but I am so good when I write with this or when I write with this type of music. Um, so yeah, so go, uh, is something that I think I'm only going to use right now when we're trying to have complete encapsulation. This one is, uh, no, I think I need you ID actually. Um, I'm going to keep it right now because I think I need it. Um, but we'll, we'll see in a second. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, 
this requires me to like talk to the API service and stuff like that, Orca. And I've already got clients that generate in TypeScript to talk to the API service. The uh, the email service doesn't talk to anything. It's it's kind of a snowflake in that regard. So it was it was completely sensical for us to do it with the email service. But um, what I will say is is once uh, once I move the api to a different type of like you know whatever then we can start using go like basically once we make it so that it's easy to make requests in other languages we'll start using it in other languages um okay cool so what else do we have here what else do we have here so we've got a lot of stuff that we think we need moa or moa more uh, morgan uh koa node 34 now so what's actually kind of interesting is like I'm not running this node version. Anyways, whatever. Let's go to NVMRC. That's fine. Okay, Doppler. Now remember, chat, if you guys don't know what Doppler is, hey, guess what? We got a we got a awesome thing to show you. Um, so Doppler essentially is how I manage all of my environment variables for my services. Uh, and the TLDR on Doppler is you create these projects in Doppler like this, right? Say for example, um, and, and we'll create a new one right now. I want to create a new one and we'll call this one quirk uh, worker uh, discord notification. And we'll say this is the uh, worker for discord notifications, right? And then we'll create a project. Now, when I create this project, it's immediately going to bootstrap me with the environments that I want or that I predetermined. So I don't have a staging. I just go from development to production because I'm a mother badass uh no yo uh uh oh b uh b uh b thank you so much b lay b lay b lay b lay i can't say your name i'm sorry but thank you so much for the 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 sub or the the prime as well thank you thank you for those bezos buckies please tell me how to say your name <laughs> um but yeah so when you create a project in doppler it'll tell you it'll create like the environments you want for it now i've i've pre-configured it so that it'll only create dev and prod for me but here's the cool part. Um, say I want to run my Quirk Worker Discord notification service here on my computer, right? Um, but I don't want to have to like manage those secrets or other things like that, right? Like I just want to be able to really, you know, run my program and not be worried about it. Well, there's a bunch of different ways of solving it. But with Doppler, it's basically a third party service that you create environment variable configurations for specific M's, right? Like dev here. Now I can add a secret like foo bar, right? And then what'll happen is when I save this like this and I deploy it to development, um, I can now use their tools to inject this into my program at runtime but you say or i'm sorry but uh you may say like okay cool you just made a random environment variable in a, in a website but like how does that connect to the to the actual um you know runtime when you run the application i'll show you so what happens is after you set your project up and you like create your environment variables and all that stuff um, you can then do what's called set up Doppler in your application. And so you create a very simpler Doppler.yaml file, and then you tell it which project you want to reference and which config, in this case, which M. So for me, I'm saying, hey, I want Doppler to always reference the Quirk Worker Discord notification project, and I always want it to load the dev values. So when I do Doppler setup, it's going to say, oh, well, it's going to first ask me for that. So hold on. <laughs> uh, let me grab my keychain thing here. Uh, okay. Uh, there we go. So now that I've added my uh, my uh, keychain or secret, um, it's saying, hey, do you want to use the settings from the config file that you just created, Doppler.yaml? And I say, yes. Once I do that, Doppler then goes, okay, cool. Well, uh, I now know that the configuration for Doppler, whenever you run it, will be for this project and this uh, this config value, whatever. And so now when I run Doppler uh, again, what I can do is I can do Doppler run. And as a matter of fact, you, you'll see here that I've got some pre uh, pre fill here that essentially is happening or my history. Uh, and what you can do is, is you can say, okay, well, now that I've set up Doppler with Doppler setup, now you do Doppler run dash dash, and then the actual command that you want to run. So essentially 
the workflow is you create a project in Doppler, you add your secrets to it, you save it for the environment that you want, and then you go into your project, you just set up the small configuration file and authenticate. And then every time you run Docker run, you just shove whatever command you want in front of it. Now I'm running Docker compose here because you know I use Docker compose, but this could be the node file itself. As a matter of fact, you can literally execute a whole shell that Doppler will just inject your environment variables into from their third-party services, and then you're good to go. So Doppler's a really dope tool. I highly recommend if you're like a solo developer, somebody who does not know how to like solve the you know management of your secrets problem um, and making sure that they're secure. Um, yeah, I highly recommend checking out Doppler. It's a really, really good tool for, again, at the bare minimum, just like small projects that, you know, you, you want to make sure your stuff's secure with, you know, um, what's up, Himanth? How's it going? Uh, I'm currently learning Next.js and it looks cool so far, even integrating with microservices. Yeah. So Pookie, I've actually been using Next.js for something as well recently. And I've, uh, you know, I'm still evaluating it, but I, I, I've, I've liked what I've used or what I've seen so far. Um, okay, cool. So what else we got? So we've gone ahead and we've got our secret set up now. Now we don't know what our secrets are yet that we need, but we do know that we need secrets. So that's just wired in place. The package.json is set up. TS config really should not change at all. Yarn.lock is good. Um, let's get check out the readme because we don't need that to be changed. Um, Git ignore, Docker ignore, Docker file, Docker file should be, yep, Docker files is fine. Entry point, yep, entry point's fine. Okay, so let's let's mess with the Docker compose here a little bit. Now, I told you before that I use Docker, con uh, Docker compose for like local development and stuff like that. Um, and so what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna update this compose discord uh, notification so that uh, it's, you know, relative to this repository. Um, so, we don't need that anymore because we put all of our environments in Doppler now. Uh, the command is the same. We don't need the health check either. I used to do health checks for Docker Compose uh, because you can kind of like check it to see if your health checks are working. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe I, yeah, I'm not going to add it now. I'll do it later. I'm not really worried about it. Um, image, Harbor. Yep, image is good. Network service is good. Okay, so we need a random port. Random port. 20, yep, perfect. Ooh, this is good, chat. I like this type of music. Okay. Um, well, I already said that, but you know. <laughs> um, okay, so what else do we need? So worker Discord notification. So out the, uh, out the gate, I know that I'm going to have to... Uh oh, hold on. Hi, DevOps. One of our partners uses this link to test integration in staging environment. Should be hitting routing. The felt like doesn't seem to be working anymore and they're getting this error. Not found. I think we got rid of the sandbox environments, did we not? Hmm. I'm not going to answer that because I'm not too sure on what that is, but... Hmm. Sandbox. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking at something for work. Uh, I don't. I, I feel like I'm getting too ahead of myself here. Let's just make the environment. Let's just make it so that it can just run from from start, and then we'll we'll figure out what we need. So we'll get rid of all of that for now. We're just gonna get rid of all of the environment injection. So you know, it's just gonna be a service that kind of starts from scratch. Okay, cool. Um, so again, what have we updated? We know that we created our source directory. Our Docker Compose is now updated. Now I do want to show you guys this really quickly. This Docker Compose configuration can be be reused by anybody. Any of you guys can reuse this Docker Compose for building node services. Here's the reason why. Um, it's a very simple setup. Now, obviously you can't use the image because this is my image, but you just replace it with this. Like just literally do this, problem solved. Um, but the reason why I'm saying that this is something that you can easily do as well is, is because it's, it's very simple in its setup. Essentially what we're doing is we're telling the container, hey, I want a command that I want you to run when you start. And it's yarn start dev, right? This is the equivalent to 
whatever you would use to do your local development, right? After that, we grab an image. Now, as I said before, you wouldn't be able to use the harbor part of it because this is my container registry, but you could use a base node image as your container runtime, right? So what's gonna happen? At the bare minimum, when you start this container, it will have node and it will try using the command. Now it will fail, because we haven't moved down far enough yet and added a bunch of other things, but it will at least, um, we don't need these either. Uh, it will at least try running the command. Now, the next thing that we do, actually we can keep the thing, is we attach it to a network. We don't really have any other services that this has got to communicate with right now, so we don't really need the network, but because we are exposing ports, um, I normally like to just attach it to its own custom network anyways, just to make sense, or just to like not have to create a bunch of default random things I don't need. So we have our networks and then we have our ports and then we have our restart on failure. What is restart on failure? It essentially means that if the process runs and it returns with a exit code of failure or one or above or whatever, uh, it'll try restarting the container. This is optional. You can disable that by deleting it and then it just won't restart after it fails. Um, these parts here, chat, these two lines or these three lines are the most important part of how you get Docker to work with local development. Without these three lines or basically without these couple entries, you can't do it. So, well, you can, but it's not as seamless in my opinion. Um, essentially what you're doing is with this like fancy little dot colon, you're saying, hey, Docker, I want you to take the current directory and I want you to put it inside of uh, the path of the container user source app. That means that all of my code is now existing inside of the container of user source app. And I want you to be able to read and write to it, right? That means that the container is no longer using its own internal file system for files, but it's now using the volume or my host files inside of the container. That's the first part. The second part is then also telling the container to change the working directory to that of the directory you just mounted, right? So what is this really telling us? This is really just starting a container in the exact same location that we're in using the exact same command that we would in the exact same working directory, right? The only difference is we're only run or we're running the command in the container. Now, if I need to do like NPM install and stuff like that, like I'm doing that on the host, right? I still have to do that here. And I want to be very clear. That is a decision that I have personally made. You know what I mean? Um, but because of that, because I can just do yarn and then like run the container, I can have the option of running a whole bunch of stuff containerized and then be like, you know what? I want to run this out of the container really quickly to check it and, and being able to do that. So this is really more about being able to lean on Docker for its encapsulation, its reusability and stuff like that. Um, rather than just making it easy for me to development or for me to develop. So, um, okay, cool. Uh, so Simlink sort of, it's not, no, it's, it's no, <laughs> uh, it, it really does like actually, uh, scope it to the, to the process. Um, but it, it's kind of like some, I mean, yeah, not really, but it's, it, you can consider you can the, so I guess the easiest way of relating it to a Simlink is you get the desired outcome of your data being in one place and now it's somewhere else that you can easily access. So that that is like a simlink but the way it works underneath the hood and all that stuff is no longer or is no no i no way near the same uh what do you do if your directory is called app rw then you do app rw rw <laughs> i don't think that's legal like I, I can you actually can you actually do that can you make a hold on make der sup son oh you can i didn't know that was legal interesting okay so yeah you just you would just do uh app rw right <laughs> and then rw <laughs> now i kind of want to do it just to like <laughs> dude somebody would be so confused <laughs> actually i think syntactually this would probably break because it would see like i don't know yeah i wonder Okay, toggle bit. Why do you ask such mysterious questions? Now I just want to like break it to see if it works. <laughs> I can't do that right now. I'm gonna be distracted. <laughs> but I'm curious now. I'm like, could you get away? Because that could be a really good hack, to be honest with you. 
you you could definitely mess with some people's minds. Break it, break it. I can't, I can't. I gotta work. I gotta work. Shout out to Togglebit, by the way. If you guys don't know Togglebit, wonderful streamer. Works primarily in Rust. So if you guys are big into Rust, this 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 man knows his stuff. Um, go give him a follow. Check him out. Say hi. Um, okay, cool. So we've got our Docker Compose set up now. Awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, can you put the actual path in quotes? You can no it's one definition because it's yaml right it's yaml so it's just you know it's just a line of it's just a string text it's how they parse it at the end of the day yeah um i want to be big into rust but i don't have the time <laughs> i mean I... okay my hot take on rust i think it's a really cool programming language i think it does a lot of neat things i think especially for like what toggle does it probably makes a lot of sense um but in all seriousness i just don't have enough validity of using it for its technical reasons of what makes it so great like most of the things i build are services cli tools stuff like that and i'm not worried about things like security when i'm building a cli tool <laughs> you know what i mean uh or memory like memory security or memory allocation and stuff like that you know what i mean not at least not not yet like maybe maybe later on but um so that's the real that's the real thing for me it's like go even in a lot of ways is uh yeah is that way too um okay so let's go to our source index.ts now what's interesting here is this has got an older way of how i used to initialize services and the reason for that is is because if we go to it you're going to see that like we have these concept of like services and service configs and then we like instantiate a service and then like inject a configuration and then tell it to start and this is how i used to do workers now i've since changed things a bit so i'm kind of wondering if that is how it is no that is how it is here okay so i am doing this even in the latest one as well all right well we'll keep with that then we'll not change it um okay so let's go back shut up let's go back here um, what we want to do is we want to change anything that says command and just change it to notification like that, right? Because this is the Discord bot notification. Um, another thing we need to do is, is we actually need to install our packages because we don't have any right now. Um, cool. And then we will go back here. And once my language server decides to start, there it is. Uh, it's going to say, hey, something's wrong. So let's go to our service now because we set up the entry point and let's fix that. Now, essentially what I do for my services is I give them a promise entry point. Um, and so the idea here, uh, if I was to just like scratch this really, or scratch this up really quickly is I have, uh, hold on, let me change this. Good Lord, this is why wow, I wish I could default to like a dark background. Um, okay, sorry about that. So let's, let's talk about this for a second really quickly on how I instantiate my services. So at the bare minimum we have called what's called a ser a quirk service uh class right um and this quirk service class is really what i use with every service to start it now this quirk service class takes on uh one argument which is a config right a a, a service config right and this service config is added to the service class and then when we run a service right we just say service dot start like this right and this is essentially how i start my services um but there's like you, you might be curious as to like okay well how did you wire it up so that your service config can like do service start well essentially in my service config i provide multiple like options and one of those options is a service entry point and this service entry point is actually an asynchronous function that is passed to the configuration just like you know the like the service name would be right in the configuration um, and this is a parameter that i i provide directly to the service so that 
service name so that it knows exactly how to start. So you're going to see in a lot of Quirk services, this concept of like a service entry point like we have here, service entry point. You'll see it's actually right here. Uh, we want to rename this from Discord bot command entry point to Discord notification entry point um, because that's the name of the service and that's that's it's at, excuse me, it's entry point. Um, now we do want to get rid of bot as well because it's actually just Discord notification entry point, not Discord bot notification entry point. Okay, there we go. So that fixes that. Okay, cool. So what have we done? So we updated our entry. Does anyone have any questions about how I do like entry points and stuff? Because like if you look here, I also have the ability of injecting the version, the name and the entry point. But does that does anyone have any questions on like how I've abstracted the whole process of starting services and stuff like that? What if environment? Oh, oh what is that for? So every service is not able to start if it doesn't have an environment and variable in its configuration, right? So at out the at, or like at the bare minimum, you can't do that. Now, there's a lot of like arguments of like, well, you could put that in here and then it could fail and stuff like that. But the reality of it is, is like, it's a lot easier if you just do it at the top level and then just like keep going. If you shove it in logic, um, it can be very ch challenging to like actually get the application to stop, uh, especially when you're doing like asynchronous work in JavaScript. There's a very common thing that a lot of JavaScript developers work with called uncaught exceptions. And that's essentially when you write something, but then you don't handle logic to catch the error when it happens. Um, uncaught exceptions are not things you normally want in your application. So yeah, uh, is that possible to not have an environment? It's, it's possible to not have an environment variable yeah it's definitely impossible it's definitely possible that the service may have been configured wrong and you know didn't get its environment variable so we just double check to make sure that we did um okay cool so the next thing we're going to want to do chat is is we're going to want to set up the service entry point itself right now in the very very start of our setup we have what's called a service context now i don't know exactly what we need for that context yet so we're going to skip it but that Service context is really where all of our like environment variables go. Um, Redis, we're gonna need Redis so we can keep Redis. We're gonna need Koa as well because we need to be able to get messages. We're gonna need health check as well. Um, and then yeah, we need this router post endpoint so that we can actually get messages. So most of these things we do need, uh, let's focus on a little bit of like what we don't need. Um, now, if we wanted to, we could actually go back to the old logic. So as I told you, this is stuff that was broken that we needed to fix. Um, and so if we go to API source routes, webhook, and then we go to stream, this is how we used to process go live notifications is in webhooks. We don't do that anymore. We've got this like, you know, crazy event driven system now. Um, but that's how we used to do it. Um, and so if we look here, if we go to like, okay, well, what, like what, what all did this have to, you know, talk with and whatever. So, uh, all right. So here's our stream callback handler, right? Um, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? So we've got user. So this is going to be an API call. We need to look up a user. So we do need the API service. So these are all valid. We need those. User email valid, Twitch OAuth, Twitch find stream, Twitch webhook find stream. And so here's all of our data for the specific go live. So like Discord events, which events we actually want to send out on, the go live text for Discord and Twitter, stuff like that. Um, category, and the, oh, we're gonna need Twitch credentials because we're gonna need to have to access Twitch, right? As a matter of fact, what might even be better is to go to the technical document um, and just see what do we need? Yeah, what do we need? Okay, so what do we need? So for Discord, we need the title, require an API call, so we need Twitch. Yep, so there's our Twitch client ID and stuff. That's good. Um, we're gonna need uh, storage of an image. So we're gonna need AWS credentials. So that's something we don't have that we're gonna need. So we're gonna need like config.aws. Oh, you know what, actually, Those are just going to be injected into the environment. 
so we don't necessarily need to have them here but we will need to check for them so that's going to be a note um discord embed custom notification so yeah i think honestly i think this is it now we will need to send a message to the discord bot saying hey speak <laughs> um so i do think that we're going to need that i don't think we're going to need discord client ids though i don't think we need the encryption key at all um yeah i don't think we need any of that stuff so this looks like a much better example now again if we look at the source code wrapping around it right what did we say like again we created our source directory we've got our docker compose our entry point all of like these main things and then once we go into our application oops once we go into our application right we create our entry point which is right here and once we create that entry point we start you know literally writing the application logic itself and so really you know what we're really doing is just connecting to redis you know setting up koa for routes and then uh wiring up our handle event for our route posts right um okay so yeah so that all looks good so let's go this or let's go to this and we're going to just wipe out everything in here we don't need any of this and we don't want any of this we want to create our own thing from scratch really so we're going to delete all of that um and then we're also going to delete all of this as well we don't need any of these as well okay so what did we say that we wanted and what we didn't want so we know that we want all the api stuff the bot discord stuff we can get rid of the discord that uh we uh, yeah so yeah it looks like that was it it looks like that was really it redis client redis okay cool it only refers to what Hmm. Anyways. Okay. So let's go back here. Let's go to index, go to our entry point, And then let's see where we are. So we have our handler event handler wired up with the values that we think we're going to at least need for now. And if we go in here, we can see that we we've got really like an empty handler here. So what this should mean, Q message. What this should mean is um, if I can fix this Redis thing really quickly, I just need to figure out what, why, why is this not liking this? Hmm. Let's see if we can fix this really quickly. I'm curious on to what, ex like why exactly this is. Is it this? Is this what it doesn't like? Yeah, I'd rather just, I don't know why that was like freaking out the way it was. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay, so let's do this chat. Let's let's just see if we can get it to start working, right? We talked about wiring all of this up. So realistically right now, we should have the ability to start this service. So let's do it. So I'm going to do Doppler setup, like I showed you before. It will make sure that Doppler is configured. And then I'm going to do Doppler... Uh, run with my run command now i'm not going to include detach because i actually want this to just run it directly so we're going to do doc docker compose up ah and look at that we have an invalid environment so we we crashed with invalid environment so echo you asked earlier would you never have is it possible to not have an environment there you go yes <laughs> it is possible to not have an environment um i'm not injecting one right now so we need to now set up the docker compose to inject those environment variables that it's expecting so for example if we go to environment and docker compose the next thing we're going to want to do is type in environment like this right like that's the value we're looking for but remember doppler is what provides these values so that means that here I need to do environment uh, dev, right? Now, if I save this, if I just save this, right? If I just save this environment dev, right? And then I go and I try and start the application again, now adding the environment value to my Docker compose and everything, right? And we do setup. I don't think you need to do setup more than once, by the way, but and if we run it, I should get a different error this time. Yeah, and so now you'll see failed invalid API public URL. 
right and that's because we've got one we got one of our environment variables but we have to add the rest of them so in this case it'd be like api public url and this would be like https colon slash slash uh dev api dot quirk dot tools i think that's right uh i think that's right <laughs> um dev api quirk tools yeah yeah that's right i uh, I actually don't know if that's the whole thing though. Hold on. Let me uh let me check a uh an existing secret without doxing myself. Hold on. Hang on, chat. Hang on. Okay. So oh, interesting. Yo, it's Jay Phils. What's up, man? How's it going, buddy? How are you? Um, I think we've got, I think now we need to start. Yeah. I think now we need to start updating the kube context. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we need to make a couple changes now because these values don't match the ones that we're expecting yet, at least. So we don't need the public URL, for example, because we're not going to be accessing the public URL at all for this but we do need the API internal URL. So we can actually get rid of the check for that value, right? Um, now, what else can we get rid of? So we know we know we know we need the API URL, the bot Discord URL, the environment, the node env, Redis host, that's all good. Um, we don't need the Discord client ID. We don't need the encrypt stuff. Uh, we need the Twitch client ID, all that stuff. Now, we also said we want the AWS access uh, key ID, right? We know that we're going to need that AWS secret key id I, th I think that's what it's called i don't remember um aws default region right as well so we, we know we're going to need those Ooh, that would have been bad if my mouse had just like accidentally landed on the dev api consumer key <laughs> um service config uh aw aws creds environment just waking up again how goes it it's going good man i'm excited to be building this sorry guys i know it's bright i want to make sure i've got the right values okay so we're gonna get rid of all of this default region yep secret access key oh it's secret access key there we go cool and like i said we don't want to actually aws access key we don't want to actually uh use this anywhere but we do want to make sure that the application checks for its existence right so we're going to do one two three and then we're just going to change these right so aws uh access key id and then invalid aws access key id right uh, invalid AWS uh, default region, right? AWS secret access key, right? There we go. Cool, cool. Yep. And then AWS default region and AWS secret access key. Cool. Okay, so now our application is actually checking for it, even though we don't necessarily need to be like passing it through the application and you'll notice i'm not i'm not technically returning it here although it might want me to oh wait no don't need that don't need that don't need that yeah there we go um yeah i did add it to the service config so it technically does want it to be returned so we'll go ahead and just add it um, but if i removed it from the service config we could easily still be checking for these but we'll make it available in in case we need to for some reason all right now ooh, 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 ooh. these are not configuration values these are secrets so these actually need to go over here it's my fault look at me putting secrets where they don't need to be am i crazy am i crazy chat uh okay so default region yep cool okay 
So then what we'll do is we'll grab this and we'll put it here, right? And then we'll grab the, oh, nope, 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 not you, you. And we'll put you here, oops, right there. Yeah. And so then we wanna grab you, put you here and take you and put you here, right? That looks good. Looks good. Dude, I'm just vibing and coding. I don't even care if people are watching. <laughs> oh, I love it. Dude, I, I love programming. All right, cool. Let's try it again. Up. Now, it should fail. But we should fail with the next error that we actually needed to fail with. Uh, invalid environment. Ooh. Why? That was a step back. Invalid environment. Really? Invalid environment. Didn't we already fix that, though? Whoa. Where are you? Worker. Discord command. Discord notification. Dev. Environment. API. Oh, we don't need API public URL though. We just need API URL. Um, environment. Although environment should be right. Let's go here really quickly. Let's go to back in LeFX. Dev. Ooh, hang on. All right, so I updated the API URL. I wanna show you guys something else that's really cool uh, about Doppler. Say that you have secrets with another secret or another thing, right? Like, so if we go here, right, you'll notice that I've got like multiple projects, right? Backend API, backend LIFX. Say I have a secret that I wanna use here that I've already defined here, right? Now I could copy and paste that, right? Easily, no problem. But what's dope about Doppler is I can actually show you how I can do it with Doppler by basically using environment or by using variables. And so now if I do dollar sign open whatever bracket thingy, um, and then we do quirk API or quirk backend API. So you see how it's automatically auto completing? That's because it's seeing Oh, hey, by the way, uh, we noticed that you've already defined this somewhere. Is this is this what you want to use? Um, and as a matter of fact, it is. So if I do backend dash API dot dev, I should be able to do API or no, no, not API, sorry, consumer key. And see this right here, backend API dev consumer key. That will now make it so that I don't have that value here. I don't have to worry about it, but it'll reference it within Doppler and make it sure that the API consumer key is what it actually should be. And so I can, you can do that with Doppler. You can reference other projects values with each other. So that like, again, like I don't know what this actually is, but I know that it's referencing the value of the consumer key for the API in, in dev. Um, and that's just like really helpful. It's a really helpful way of being able to get this set up, you know, uh, get this all set up for you. Um, so if we do up, what did we miss? Property API public URL. Oh, so kube. API. So why does it think that it wants a public URL still? Public. Oh, because of handle event. I see. 
So this doesn't want to be, it, it, we don't want it to, we want it to be API. Oh, well, yeah, we just want it to be that. Okay, I see. So I need to update this API consumer key API URL. Uh, you know what I love about programming when local development and production work seamlessly? I think you and like the rest of the world. <laughs> uh, that is always a, that is always a desired outcome when things work. Okay, that should work. At least that should give us another error. Invalid API URL. Okay, so let's go back to Docker Compose now. Yep, because we don't have it. So API URL. Nope. Nope. Stop at tab nine. I don't want you to do it that time. Uh, API consumer key. So we've got those three so far. We also need node env technically node env. Um, and we'll add that here. Node env uh, production. Do I want to say production here? Yeah, I do. Cause we always use production, even in dev, we use environment as our definition, but whenever we run it in a container, we always use the production value. Um, what else, what else, what else, what else? So node env, let's go to the kube context. So AWS, oh, we need AWS stuff. Um, AWS access key ID, AWS default region. Oh, come on now. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> default region, AWS secret access key. Okay, cool. So that's all the AWS stuff. Uh, what else we got? We got bot discord URL, bot discord URL so that we can communicate with the bot, bot discord consumer key. Uh, we'll do here as well. Flip it. Red. Oh, yep. Good call. Yep. Redis. Redis as well. Yep. Uh, Redis. It's the Redis host. Come on now. I don't understand why it won't let me undo that. Redis host. Hose? <laughs> host. Uh, Redis password. Yep. I think that's it, right? No, Twitch. We need Twitch as well. Yeah, because we're going to make Twitch API calls. Twitch client ID. Twitch client secret. Oh, sandbox is dead. Okay, cool. I was, I was right. I guess I could have said that. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure though if sandbox was dead or not. So, um, okay. So we've got all of our values, but if we look at Doppler, we're going to notice that we're missing some. So let's go ahead and try adding what we can. So we've got our consumer key, right? That's a reference API. That one's good. We've got, we don't have our, any of our AWS stuff. But we'll skip that for now. Let's see what else we can add. So we've got our bot Discord consumer key. That's one we can use, right? Because it's already a reference. So quirk bot discord dot dev consumer key, right? So there we go. Now we've got the bot disk. Like you see how nice that is, chat? You see how nice that is? It's just so nice to be able to do that. Um, I need to get the Discord command uh oof this is risky <laughs> hold on let me let me hide my screen for a second i i don't i don't want to show any of this because there's there's secrets in here <laughs> interesting okay so apparently it's <laughs> copy the keys <laughs> you're fine uh I, I make precautions so you can't <laughs> uh what's up though how's it going um all right so i do need this stuff though yeah so see all these domains here these are all essentially domains that used to exist elsewhere that now or now that used to exist in these dot m files that now exist in our you know whatever 
So Quirk bot Discord. Now these are internal. You can't access these, so these aren't things that you can access. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got our Discord stuff. What else do we need? Uh, do boop, Kub. Um, oh wait, no, sorry, not to Kub context. Let's go here. So okay, consumer key API URL. We'll add the AWS stuff in a second. We've got the Quirk bot Discord dev consumer key, dev bot Discord, yep. Domain, production, node M, those are all there. Environment there, node M, Redis host, Redis host, Redis password, Twitch client ID and Twitch client secret. Twitch client ID. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Twitch client secret and let's just save these for now let will just be blank for now that's fine and let's add the other ones as well AWS access key id again they'll be blank for just a second this one doesn't have to be blank us west too i mean it's really your fault chat <laughs> these have to be blank because of you um give me one second okay cool all right so what have we got so we've got a bunch of stuff pre-populated, right? Like our API consumer key, API URL, uh, default region, uh, bot discord dev production. But now we need to add some other things. Now the Redis host, that should be one that was from the M variable file. So I should be able to, yeah, see this one? That's a domain that we can use, Redis host. Dev Redis Quirk, password, Twitch client ID, client secret, AWS. Okay. So I've pretty much got almost everything we need now that isn't like either, you know, or that is like, you know, reusable or stuff like that. So what that means now is like the Redis password is unique to the service, the Twitch client ID. Now, these all aren't, but I. I don't want to reference things that aren't unique to a specific service so that if they change or I remove them, it doesn't break things. So you might be asking like, well, why don't you just like reuse the access key for a different service? Well, for one, in this case, it's actually for this specific service, but even in the circumstances of like the Redis password, which is shareable within all the services, um, it may be like, it's something that would globally change. So unless I make sure that that global change is reflected everywhere, I don't want to have it that way. And so I'm going to be manually copying and pasting these values in. I just needed to figure out what I could copy and paste or what I needed to copy and paste because I have to hide my screen when I do it. <laughs> um, I don't like that hovering with the mouse shows the value. Yeah, that's a little, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree on that one. That one is a little frustrating. Um, I don't know. It is what it is. It totally is what it is. Is that I3? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So now that I've got this, I'm going to quickly in my, my nice little hidden screen here, copy all of the other, uh, uh, copy all of the other values in. Okay. So just give me one second. I'm going to copy the rest of the secrets in, and then we'll be done setting up the, um, it's inconvenient your stream. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. I mean, it's definitely inconvenient for stream. I'll, I'll honestly though, Amir Kiev, I I'll be real. I don't even like it outside of the stream, but you know, it is what it is. Like I, I it, you're definitely right that it's mostly impactful just for streaming. Uh, okay. One second. Let me copy over these values. Let me get the rest of these in here so that, um, we can start actually building the rest of this. So yeah, hold on one second. All right, we're good. Okay. Uh, so one thing to note is, Ooh, I thought I doxed myself for a second. Yeah. These things are tricky, man. Uh, one thing to note about this is that I removed the AWS credentials. And the reason for that is, is because I already have those in my environment. Um, so I'm going to use mine on my machine. And then later when we deploy it, we'll re we'll use the credentials that we want for the service. So for now it's, Okay. Uh, for now, it's just going to use the ones that are on my machine. All right. I'm closing this before I dox myself. Uh, okay. So now that we've got that, we should be able to start this service entirely now. Yeah. We should have everything we need now. All right. So let's do it. Dude, that, that page is terrifying. 
Invalid Discord client ID. Discord client ID. Why are we looking for Discord client IDs still? Client. Oh, that's why. Because they're still there. Oh, wow. We're still looking for like encrypt keys and stuff to still too. What the heck? Okay, so let's get rid of this. Um, Get rid of this. There we go. All right, Chad, there we go. All right, so now, <laughs> now it should run. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you want, dude. I'm I'm super down. Yeah. Why is this taking so long? Yeah. Just whenever you want to contact shift, I'm I'm down. Yeah. Chat, we may have a little bit of a surprise for you guys. What the what is going on here? Why why are you taking so long? Oh geez, not that. <laughs> I do that too often to myself. Um yeah, just 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 let me know when you when you when you want to. Hey, look at that chat. There we go. Service successfully started. And if we wanted to, right, I could even do this. I could be like uh, this. Oh, nope. I don't want to tile horizontally. I want to tile vertically. Okay. And then we'll go to worker, right? And let's go down to uh, Discord notification. Okay. And then let's go here. Let's figure out what was our exposed. Yeah, so 21194. Cool. All right, so let's do curl HTTP colon slash slash localhost. Boop. Health check. Hey, look at that. And our health checks work. So the service is running successfully in our Docker container. And it's really like, it's really not doing anything, right? It's just blank code, really. Like it's, it's you know, we've just basically created a, 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 a blanket template service, right? Now at this point, what we can start doing though is, is if you think about it, we've got all of our AWS credentials. We've got all of our, you know, all of our other credentials for our services. We're now ready to start writing, you know, writing, uh, writing our, uh, our application. Yo. Yo, so thank you so much for the raid, dude. Sorry I missed you. I, I, first I was on break. Um, secondly, dude, thank you so much for the raid. I hope, I hope I didn't, I hope I, uh, I hope you weren't gone for too long. Yo, what's up, dude? Uh, thank you for the raid, man. Appreciate you. How long ago? Oh, that was two minutes ago. I just had the weirdest thing happen. Uh, I have an echo. There you go. Do I still have an echo? No. Okay. Um, so, okay. So super weird, super weird. I took my break and I was like, okay, cool. No worries. Uh, apparently somebody rang the doorbell. So I was like, oh, weird. And so I look outside and there's like these two like construction workers. And I was like, uh, okay, what's going on? And so I look <laughs> and he's like, he's like, Hey man, um, I was, I, we were doing some stuff for the city cause they're like city workers. And he was like, um, I accidentally cut a tree into your yard. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, yeah. Do you mind if I go into your backyard? Like I, uh, I, I, I ac you know, we accidentally cut a tree that fell into your yard and I was like, uh, okay, sure. Uh, and so like, I was like, dog, I'm not letting you just go in my backyard by yourself though. So like, I get out and like, I walk him into the backyard and like he goes further back in the yard and then he just looks at it. Yeah, yeah. And he just looks at it and then he goes, oh, it's your neighbor's yard. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, no, it fell into your neighbor's yard. And I was like, how do you not know where this came from? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm guessing it was a very, very large tree. And uh, and, and it, yeah, I, I, I was very high up. I don't know. But yeah, that, that was that was really, oh, it was super sus. Yeah, no, super sus. I mean, granted, they do have a massive, like, truck that is also filled with <laughs> tree clippings and stuff. So it's it's also pretty checks out. But yeah, it was also it was it was definitely a little weird. Uh, give me one second though. I gotta go close my side gate. Um, I I meant to close my side gate really quickly, but I I yeah I saw the raid. So 
I'm sorry, dude. I didn't mean to miss the raid. I, I super apologize that if there is anybody still from your stream, thank you for being here. I, I do apologize. Um, I, like I said, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. Give me one second though. Just let me go close. I got to close that gate. Give me one second. All right, there we go. Um, sorry guys. Okay, cool. So I, I closed the gate. Will somebody please let me sit down? I would love to sit down. I've been standing for four hours. <laughs> somebody please let the man sit down. I would appreciate it. Um, okay, cool. So let's hop back into this. Now, last time we started working, uh, and by the way, if you're, if you're new here, you don't know what's going on. Uh, thank you, Steffi. <laughs> you're going to wait a second because I want to sit. Ah, that's better. Okay. That's more comfortable. Okay. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am BG. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Alta 4 stream. And today we are working on something called uh, Quirk. Uh, Quirk is basically a streamer tools platform we've been building for the past two years. Uh, it's in invite only alpha at the moment, but we are currently building some of the features that we broke when we migrated uh, to the cloud and did some other changes. So one of those features is our discord notifications. Essentially, whenever a streamer goes live, hey, streamer, uh, there's a message that Twitch sends on behalf of them to us. And that is essentially them letting us know that a specific event happened, in this case, like a go live. Um, we take that message and we process it internally via a message broker right here. Uh, and then this message broker forwards it to our workers, essentially. We are building the worker for our Discord notifications. Um, as well as our Twitter notification. So whenever somebody goes live, it'll immediately be able to embed that into a nice Discord message and have all that cool stuff. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, so this is how it works. Yeah. <laughs> Where in Florida did you and Atota meet? I am from there and still live and work in Florida. Place called Lakeland. I'm from a, I'm from a town called Lakeland. Um, yeah. Very small town. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and start the service again and make sure that it's running. Yep, fantastic. Okay, so we are getting a service essentially running completely properly now and we're we're good to go. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's hop into our service code itself from Orlando. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Orlando's right around the corner from us, like an hour, basically. I mean, we're smack, Flor or Lakeland's smack dab in the middle, so yeah. Um, all right, cool. So here we are. So basically to do implement all the things, right? This is, this is what we need to be working on. We need to be implementing all the things, right? Um, now what we need to do is, is we need to take a few things into consideration. First, we need to think about how we did this before, right? Um, now before what we did was we took the request via a callback endpoint. This is how it actually used to be done. Uh, Twitch would hit us via a callback endpoint uh, with webhooks. And so this is a webhook that we used to use for stream go lives. So we are going from a uh, an event-based system, which I mean, webhooks are really event-based, but more of a, uh, a, a fully subscribed system rather than just saying like, okay, we have one endpoint that does one thing, which is a stream callback. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look here. So we get a Twitch stream response. Now this is already gonna be different, but we can kind of start working on this a little bit, which we could say like, okay, well, the event here should be a event sub event stream online. So this structure, and I've actually already done this, I created all of the types that exist manually. I did all of this manually. Uh, I created the types um, so that they match what the shapes of responses that come back from Twitch. So this event sub event stream online, this is the data that we actually get back from Twitch uh, when, when it happens. Um, <clears throat> and so what we wanna do is, is we wanna say uh, const, uh, we'll deconstruct it, event. So we wanna start getting some of the event data. And so we've got data right here, right? Um, and this is where our data is our event sub event stream online or undefined. Now, if we don't have any data, we might as well just throw an error right now and say, uh, invalid message data, right? Cause we don't have any data to process. So there's really nothing we can do here. 
um once we have that const or we can say uh we'll just do like console.log data like this event substream online and then we'll just say like data dot okay so what do we have here so in our stream online we have the id of the stream we have the type of event we have the when the stream was started and the broadcaster's information that is really bleak <laughs> that is about it um however we can see here that we grab the twitch id and we look up the user in the database so we can still we could still even do this right because we have the broadcaster user id which would be the twitch id so let's do that so let's let's wire up the ability to make a request to the api now just like avi said earlier um i also in quirk have a lot of reusability in a lot of different places like a lot of my logic can just kind of be copied and pasted and changed a little bit to get it working the way it needs to and because a lot of these workers do like similar things a lot of this logic is even shared or reproducible very simply um, and so what i want to do is is i want to just go to say for example like text here <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry, not text. Let's go to uh, event. Yeah, event. Um, now in here, yep, we, genera we generate a client. So here we go. This is our API client. And you can see we've already got our API URL, which we wired up and injected into the container. Same thing as the consumer key. So we should, out the gate, already be good to start making API calls if we need to, right? We then get our SDK which is what actually is our generated code. Um, and we can say, there we go, get SDK. And then our SDK provides us with a bunch of different functions that we can use with our requests. And in this case, we've got service command, service discord bot update, service user update. What we really want is just service user. We wanna look up a user from a service. Uh, and so we'll say const, user res equals await uh service service user there we go user like that and so that is our graphql request and and you can see here we've got an input value and then in this input value we're going to give it the parameter of twitch id um, and that will be the data dot broadcaster user id so what's going to happen is once we get this message from twitch we're going to extract the data from it set up an api client and immediately make a uh, request to our api service saying hey we just had a message come through with this broadcaster user id is that somebody in our system Right. We want to make sure that this is somebody we know first. So what we then want to do is, is we want to say um, if there is uh, in user, uh, oops, sorry, user res dot service user. Okay. So actually, hold on. Let me re let me abstract some of this a bit. User res, and we'll say service, and then user. There we go. And now we'll say that if we have no user or if the user dot email valid, if the user's email is not valid, which is just really, that's just our band. Like if the user invalid, then they don't, they can't do anything in the system. So instead of saying like user band or not, this is really our band. Um, if I disable this, like nothing works anywhere for, for them. So yeah, this is really our like band or not. Um, Hey, finally found the other guy. What other guy? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, what's up, Socken guy? Anyone in chat experience with ring lights? Thinking of purchasing a ring light for home office, not sure if the light may distract in some way. Uh, yeah, me. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, so what I can tell you about it is you really just want to make, some, make sure you can get something that you can diffuse. Ring lights really aren't that bad when you can diffuse the light. Like you can look at my face, like if I make this brighter right? Like it just softens the light across my face, really, right? It's not like blasting my eyes or anything like that. So I have a diffuser so that it's even if I'm staring at it directly, it doesn't like kill my eyes. Um, I would recommend making sure that you've at least got and you've got control over like the light, you know, 
a little light amount and stuff like that. Like, actually, I should probably make, make mine a little lighter because the day has passed a bit. There we go. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, okay, cool. So at this point, we should have a val. Okay, we're going to do a monkey type. It's been a minute since I've done a monkey type. Downloading user data. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I'm messing up real bad on this one. I'm just going to restart. Uh, I'm pretty confident that this is like purposely giving me stuff that I'm not good at because I'm like, it's getting harder, uh, which is really weird. Yeah, it's, oh my gosh. Are you kidding me, dude? It's forcing me to use all of my pinky fingers. I'm not even kidding you right now. This is purposely making this tougher for me. I, 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 wow, this is weird. Holy crap. I wasn't expecting that. That was, does monkey type get harder as you get better? Like, are they doing machine? Like, like, so here's the thing. Here's where this is kind of tough. If it's constantly getting better, it becomes more difficult for you to gauge your actual metric because it's always changing. I don't care about my words per minute. That was bad. But what I really did notice was it was forcing me to do a lot of typing. Like I have problems typing with my pinkies. Like I, cause I, I'm just, I'm just not that great with it. Um, and it felt like a lot of that was pinky typing. Now I could just be losing my mind, but let's try it again. So like, down fact general here leave what get see off help first by possible course this also against first govern each only ask some word become pro wow, present late uh plan small if man where without see p again I, I'm, I'm so not good with p's i feel like it's I, I genuinely feel like it's actually forcing me to use things that i'm not good with if that's the case i don't mind it but i don't know it's frustrating it's annoying <laughs> i don't want to always be fighting it i just want to know the metric uh anyways okay so again i was able to copy that and set up the client pretty pretty easily um so let's go back here so we do this we've got this in our code now and then we go here and we grab the user's ID and their Twitch OAuth. And then we say Twitch ID, Twitch OAuth, user, invalid OAuth. Okay, so I think I understand why we're doing this. Thanks, you got a, uh, you got a ref link? Oh, for what? Oh, for a, oh, for a, uh, a, uh, light. Uh, no, not really. The light I've got was like 15 bucks. I, I, as long as you get something with a good diffuser, that's really what matters. Yeah. Okay. So why are, we're getting the user ID and then we're getting the Twitch OAuth and we're grabbing the webhook. Oh dude. You know what chat? I think I just realized something, which is, I don't know if we have this data in the database. Yeah. So we might actually need to do some work to the API in the front end before we can do this. Um, so if we go to source entity, Twitch event sub, bot, stream alert, schedule notification, reputation, media type. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I see. So if we go to Quirk right now, uh, if we go to Quirk right now, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Um, and we go to integrations and then Twitch, and then we click on notifications. You'll see here that we have like all of this UI. Well, none of this actually works. Uh, this data is not being stored anywhere. It's not being saved anywhere. Um, but I thought I wired up entities, but maybe I, maybe I didn't um response data 
Okay. Um, interesting. So yeah. So. Hmm. We don't have this data stored anywhere. Uh, and because we don't have this data stored anywhere, we have no like types of it. Uh, and we, we can't even, you know, we can't even get data from it. Um, so we're going to need to store this in the database, meaning that we're going to actually have to make some changes to the API service before we go any further, because really what we need to do now is, is we need to look up the existing go live notification data really for that user. Um, but we don't have any of that data. Um, so we need to ask ourselves a couple questions. Yeah, what's up, Dumpster Dev? How's it going? Um, the first one being, so I think if I go to my API service here, uh, oh, and then we do rebase, that is fine. But, oh, I deleted all that work. Dang. I didn't realize I did that, but I deleted all that work. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. So what we need to do chat is, is we need to go to the API first and we need to create a new entity. Um, and the reason why we need to create a new entity is because we need to store the configuration data for go lives, right? So for example, uh, if we go back to quirk, where did I put quirk? Where are you? Oh, did I close it by accident? Uh, let's go to dev portal just so i'm not like showing stuff i don't want to be showing uh if we go into dev portal and then i go to like chatbot commands integration twitch notification yeah here we go twitch notifications you'll see again that we have this ability of like set send your go live message for discord so forth and so on we need to describe this in a way that makes sense and then we need to store it somewhere two things Two things here, two things here. One, up until now, we've stored data all in one place. Um, and we're gonna keep doing that for now, but in the near future, um, we're going to, does it use HTTP2? Uh, yeah, but it's just, in, it, it's using whatever Cloudflare uses. So thank you for the gifted sub, by the way, my dude. Um, Mind if I ask a couple questions? Are you a developer by day? I see the channel is DevOps work. Oh, you know what, dude? I We were doing DevOps work earlier and I totally forgot to change it. <laughs> Building in TypeScript. But yeah, no, I'm a, uh, I'm a technically I'm a senior software engineer. Um, I work in DevOps. Um, oh, shoot. I totally got distracted with things uh okay sorry i had to message a coworker. i felt bad i totally left him hanging by accident uh what's the motivation for streaming uh it's something i love doing <laughs> that's really it yeah i just love doing it um and i you know i like building things so it you know it's kind of two things two birds one stone scenario um yeah i just enjoy doing it and we got, you know, we got lucky enough to create some type of a cool community around it. So it's just really been something we've been running with that's, you know, we've just kind of been like awesome, <laughs> you know, like uh, full of wonderful surprises, I should say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a senior software engineer. Uh, I've been working in engineering for 10 years. Uh, I, I work right now and specialize in DevOps. So I work at the company called or at a company called Hippo um i think that's it yeah uh and you can you can take more look at that if you want to as well but yeah um yeah i, I specialize in devops at the moment all right cool um so i'm stalling a bit here because i'm also trying to think of exactly how i want these to be represented um in the database and there's a few things that i kind of want to think about here the first one is in the future, I want this data to be very separatable from the database because at some point, these services will eventually have their own databases. We, we will start slowly separating the databases from like their main place and having more of like a micro, a real microservice where like each microservice has its own database. 
the separation of concerns and stuff like that. But because I don't want to have to deal with like deploying a whole nother Postgres database and, you know, credentials and all that stuff. For now, we're just going to add this to the existing API service and then it'll make a call just like everything else does. So what's interesting is we can solve this problem a couple of different ways. Um, now, this is for Twitch notifications, right? Um, and it allows us to, for each Twitch notification, configure what we want to do for it. So again, like go offline, go live. Eventually there's going to be a lot of other things here. These are just the two that we're supporting currently. So out the gate, this kind of makes me think that we want to call this, um, let's do creating, uh, creating a notification schema, right? Um, and I'm just going to like, jot this down here right now just because I don't really know what I want yet but I'm thinking that we'll create like a table in the database called something like uh hmm I don't know if twitch notification makes sense let's go to our existing entities so discord stream alert twitch bot twitch channel reward twitch event sub hmm twitch event sub I guess we could just do twitch event sub event that might be the play here is just call it twitch event sub event and then have each okay so yeah let's 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 explore this a bit so uh new table right this would be called twitch event sub event right um and in this table well what would the schema look like well i would say for starters it would definitely have a user id of some type uh random uuid generator um copy Boop, put that in there okay so we know that, that it's going to have a user id because that's what we look up in the worker um the challenge here really is that like discord lifex twitter we're going to be constantly adding more support for other things and we need a way of having so that like every single one of these can have Discord, LiveX, Twitter options, but they may not all have other ones or they may not have Discord or they may like, in a way these are more like documents than they are SQL because not every row is going to look the same here. So what I'm thinking about doing is how does Postgres handle JSON B, right? So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we're going to make these into JSON uh, B keys so that we could do something like this where we could just say like Discord, right? And then just have an object. And that can be whatever we describe in code. Uh, same thing for this, Twitter, and then have an object. Um, Otherwise, like this data is just going to get out of control and we're going to have like tables upon tables upon tables. So what would this look like if we went even further? So like here, let's let's do this. Let's move this over here so that we've got these next to each other. So for example, Discord, right? Discord has like a channel ID, which would be like whatever something like this. I'm just putting in random values. Um, text or maybe like a uh, message, right? Um, and so this could be like 
Hey, we are going live now, right? Um, Twitter would just have text. And the reason why we have text separation between both of them is sometimes you don't want to say the same thing on Twitter, right? Like sometimes you'd be like, hey, uh, at everyone in Discord, right? But then you'd be like, hey, we are going live. Uh, right, like maybe you've got like small variants or something because it's Twitter or something like that. So it does make sense to have separate things here. So if we have Twitch event sub event, this would mean that we would then need to bind the Twitch event sub event to the to like a type, right? And so that in the database, we could at least know what this is for. So this would be like a stream online, right? So when we get a stream online event, right? We have connection keys that can do things. Now we could also, if we wanted to flatten these, right? Discord channel ID, Discord message, right? And if we did this, then this would make it much more SQL essentially where We'd say like, okay, this can be null. This can be null. Like all of these can essentially be null. Um, the reason why I kind of don't want to do this is just like, okay, let's get a little bit crazier with this now. So we've got, for example, we've got uh, Discord channel ID, Discord message, right? Twitter text, right? Um, what about LIFX? So then we'd have to add lifx scene id and then this would be another random uuid i don't know maybe this does work maybe this maybe this is fine and so yeah so this is what the data that we would store in our database relative to a twitch event sub event but so say like when a follow happens interesting this would make it so that we could actually move yeah so at some point in the future the way that this works or this is working now like stream alerts and this will all get migrated to twitch notifications essentially yeah so this will just be like a big matrix i this might actually work <laughs> this this might actually work this schema is a little difficult to validate because what we're doing now is, is we're saying like, okay, you need this and this for this to be valid. Right. So realistically, like we would probably want to write some decent, uh, SQL to where it knows like this, if this or this is in, uh, if basically these have to both be populated if you're filling this out and this has to be populated by, this can be by itself. This can be by itself. This can be by itself. Right. So we'll have to do some indexing and stuff like that to make sure that we don't store bad data. But new table in database. Hmm. We need to create a schema for our notifications that store data when events happen. Yeah. Discord channel ID. Yeah, so that's fine. Discord message is fine. Also, I guess we would we would then have to be like uh, Discord enabled, right? Uh, true, yeah. So now what we can say in the database is we can say if Discord enabled, then these must be... Okay, yeah, so that, that's good. That That does kind of help. Um, it does mean that we have to add this to everything, which just means more keys, right? LifeX enabled true. Twitter enabled true. Right. Yeah. Twitter enabled Twitter text. LifeX enabled LifeX scene ID. Discord message. I mean, again, it's... It's the downside of SQL, 
which is you know again if we're looking here at what we're trying to build we're basically just see, we're, we're we're playing here chat we're just we're just seeing like what do we like what how do we like how this looks right so the idea is is that if you have discord enabled we will need to write some kind of sql logic and store it as an index or un unique or whatever i can't remember what it is but basically we need to make sure that if it's enabled these can't both of these right both of these well actually not both of these but one of these channel id can't be null right so if enabled channel id cannot be null that's that is a sql validation error right uh or another validation the same thing for here if lifex enabled then scene uuid cannot be uh cannot be null right or or empty as well um same thing for uh same thing for twitter tech so this would this would make sure that these don't get stored improperly wouldn't it be better to have one pro, pro so that's the thing dude is like what you're talking about now seshi is i would need one table per 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 system right so we would do like uh event sub event you know see I, I don't know like it's it's difficult because these are only specific to event sub events so it would be like twitch event sub event discord i guess right and then you would have all your discord data and then lift and then you'd have all your like you'd have to separate it that way i guess that's not what you said what did you say one row per system okay well what what are you suggesting then seshi because the only way i can see of refactoring this in a way that's scalable and makes sense is keeping the types right but then making it like per connection where like you know twitch event sub event again discord or something like that and then you could have you know a row with all the discord meta data right and the same thing for uh for you know any of these um but that's just my thought you know that's just my maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong on that i'm not the greatest at databases so <laughs> yo thank you for the 5k rep up by the way status hello hello hey back to rank one nice okay you just got enough just got enough <laughs> okay so let's see here so twitter enabled twitter text but yeah share 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 with me tell me what you're what you're thinking i'm, I'm gonna grab a drink give me one second <laughs> you're the second person who said that reset button push but i'm interested in seeing what that is yeah okay so seshi um you must have just gotten here because i originally was thinking about that about five minutes before i started doing this this way um the the the, the challenge with what you're suggesting with with using json right don't get me wrong i don't disagree with you here is that json you know it, it's completely untyped um and there's not really any validation that i at least that i know of that I can use around it. Now, maybe I could integrate with type ORM so I can have some type of like object level validation, but I don't think I'm going to have any validation whatsoever within uh, what's it called. And another thing I'm slightly worried about, oh, you've been here for hours. Okay, cool. Well, so what about migrations then, Sashi? What about like my having to migrate the JSON data? And again, I'm not trying to be rude at all. I'm just, I'm trying to understand like those are the things that worry me right is when i have you know sql with columns and rows and you know basically just all of the normal stuff um i can migrate that stuff easily right if i if i need to in the future do need to turn this into something nicer i can my concern is just going to a document approach um it becomes di more difficult to manage documents you know what i mean but let me know your thoughts like uh like a table with type uh user id system enabled and settings where settings is a json yeah yeah i see so here i'll i'll write your suggestion because i don't disagree i don't think it's a bad one let me let me try it okay so let's do what let's do what you're suggesting so uh we'll say type right so type this really i guess we could say this is the event type to make this a little bit simpler but we do need this type here at, at, at some in some sense right um so now what we could say is exactly exactly yeah yeah 100 percent seshi and so dude seshi honestly i'm almost kind of wondering like dude i wonder if this 
would be better in a you know non-relational database but let's work like again that's why i also said like i'm not ready to rip this out of the database because if i did then i think you and i both agree we'd probably like what you know use something that is better with this kind of thing and we could just attach it directly to this worker <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we can't right now. So we are going to try and keep it in, in an SQL approach um, at least. But yeah, let's let's try writing the approach that you've got, you're, you're thinking. So this is the event. We'll, we'll, so this is the type of event. I think it makes sense to have this like this. Okay. So then what we'll do is, is we'll say um, provider, right? Because I think that's really what we would do. And then it'd be like Discord, right? I, like I get, I, and we'll say that this is like an enum, right? Like I, I get, I get you guys are wanting to use enums, right? And as a matter of fact, not only this is probably an enum, but this will definitely be an enum as well. Both of these are enums, right? So discord, right? And then I think what we're saying now is, is like, then we would do something like, you know, setting settings, right? And then in here, this is really like anything really. Uh, or, or, or you know what I mean? Um, so this is, this is what you're, this is what we're suggesting. Right. And then, so for example, uh, we could then do like, okay, provider discord. And then in here we could be like, you know, channel ID, so forth and so on. So, yeah, so I don't disagree with you. Like, I don't dis like, I don't think this is bad. I'm genuinely just trying to think if this is going to shoot me in the foot compared to just having to deal with this you know what i mean um because this is more verbose don't get me wrong it definitely is but this we can both agree i think that it is also this is the way more sql way of doing it um and it's not clean it's not clean and it's not pretty but this is how i've done this up until now and it's been at least something that I can continually iterate over. Um, hmm. But the thing that is really nice here is, is like, you know, being able to just at any time, if we want to add something, just be able to add it. Hmm. And so enabled. What would this query look like to... So here's the interesting thing about this is if that's the case, then these become much like this, this page here that we've got is going to have a lot more. It's going to have three requests per thing. So like you click on this, it's going to go one, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, I think it's one of the best solutions without using no SQL in regards. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think here, let, let's do this as well. Let's do this type ORM JSON B. I'm pretty sure type ORM does give you some control over it. Like, right. Like column nullable default, nothing. That's good. Okay. We might need to actually start jumping into code here if we really want to see what this looks like. But it looks like we like like I guess what I'm saying is is like I might be okay with this if we can then give like really good types. You know what I mean? Um Yeah. Could you have multiple tables and provider field to select the correct table? Yeah, I mean that's another idea, right? Is is with SQL you would you would basically you'd basically split it based off of provider. <laughs> Alphonse just got freaked out because the mail was delivered. Um, sorry. So uh, yeah, that would be in a. It's just more. You know, it's just it. It's just like more tables in the database. You know. This is really what happens when you start dealing with like, again, lots of data sources and you're trying to like connect them and things like that. Like, yeah, um, I don't think this is bad. I, I actually don't think that this is bad. Um, and I'm almost interested in saying, let's iterate on this. I just joined, but it seems like the first approach is doable. So here's the problem. Anybody who suggests a provider-based approach, I don't disagree with you at all. 
we have no opinionations about providers at all in the application whatsoever right now, right? So all of the all of the data as it stands in the database looks like this. It, it really does. It was purposely done this way because I didn't know. Well, and it's not that I didn't know, but I knew at some point I was going to move to a provider base where like we have like a provider table that has like, you know, your connections of your providers and then like all like, you know, really break it down the way that we're talking about. The challenge is, is that really it's 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 all like this right now. And so I'm almost like the challenge is, is if we introduce something like this in this, it, they're going to be completely contradicting and we might have like really bad schema challenges when we try mixing the two. Um, the reason why I'm just considering doing this is, is because if I do this, then it makes it easier to go to a provider based later on, right? Because all the data is where I expect it to be. And then I can literally just rip this out, remap everything into migrations and yeah. Um, that seems like a painful migra- it is. No, it is. But here's a bigger painful migration that you guys don't really know about that will be happening as well, which is we'll eventually be moving to Prisma. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're really going to be moving to Prisma at some point. Um, and because I want to move to Prisma, um, I'm, I'm holding off really any massively serious um, opinionations around these kind of things. But yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. This is a this is a thing that we are aware of that is challenging and something that yeah it, it has been put off. Um, and I'm I'm super aware of it. Yeah, yeah. I think we're gonna stick with this way. Honestly, I know, and I think you can all sit here and agree with me that like we all love this approach, but SQL is really annoying <laughs> i think we can all agree with that and it will make more sense for us to design systems that are at least prepared to be migrated rather than having systems where we're like oh well we kind of wanted to migrate it so we just did it then and uh well yeah we'll just figure it out later like that's a really bad approach this way i know again it's more verbose but this way i know how to migrate from this right because it's just right it's you know it's it's just big it's just big whatever you know columns so yeah I, I as much as i know that this is not the most desired approach oh dang my order will be here in seven minutes i'm working on something called quirk it's basically a stream tools platform uh if you've ever heard of stream elements or stream labs we're building something similar but better um and uh, but i what i mean by that is is <laughs> In time, it will be better. <laughs> uh, what we have built, I believe, is better. Uh, but we still have a lot of what we call feature parity to catch up with. So, um, yeah, we're working on that right now. And one of those feature parities is, uh, yeah, we we you know is is uh, is in fact go live notifications and processing all of that and stuff. Oh shoot, hang on a second. Sorry guys, I have a delivery that's about to be here. Sometimes you need to forsake pretty for clever. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. This is so pretty and nice, but like the reality, the reality of it is, is, um, wait, could you really still hear? I thought I muted it. Eh, that's fine. Just a delivery. Um, but yeah, no, actually the only thing I really care about is if I accidentally like dox the guy's phone number, that would, that would really only be the thing I care about. Um, but yeah, no, I like, I love this. I want to use this. Oh, he's trolling. Okay. I was like, I'm pretty sure I pressed the button, dude. Uh, um, I think we're going to have to go with this. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit more work, but again, we already know how to do this and we don't need to overly complicate this. Yeah. Just a heads up. I was using Prisma in my pet project and a mega adder because it does not support geospatial data at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm aware. So poll, I've used it as well. I used version one. I have not used version two, the newer version or whatever. Um, but they did not actually support not only geospatial data when I was doing it, but also JSONB, uh, which is one of the reasons why I ended up going with Type ORM because Type ORM had that support. I'm pretty sure they support JSONB now. I'm not 100% if they do or not. Um, but yeah, they didn't support JSON B back then for Postgres. So I didn't end up using it, but yeah, same problem, <laughs> same problem. Um, the reason why I do want to try it is, is because 
Um, I want to re. I I'm. I want to. I want to. So poll. Believe it or not, dude. I'm not using JSON or like any kind of really crazy types in our, in this whole like application really at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at the schema, you could probably you could probably look at that and be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I I when we go to Prisma. I'm going to massively, as you saw, massively refactor the schemas so that they're even simpler and we're not relying on that. And then I will say this, I only want Prisma to be the main basic data layer, right? When we talk about things like geospatial data, more complex things like machine learning, like whatever, any kind of stuff like that, I'm going to build those services as microservices with their own separate databases because one of the things we will eventually be doing is, is we will be taking this API service and turning it into an API gateway um, where we'll be actually using GraphQL for what it really is meant for, which is taking a bunch of microservices and stitching them together. Um, and so that's going to be the goal. The goal is, is going to be to get out of what we got now, move back to, you know, uh, like saying on GraphQL, using a different backend and then making it so that, yeah, yeah, we use GraphQL. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we know what our schema needs to look like. So let's go ahead and create our file. So we're going to go to entity, uh, new, and then we're going to go file and we're going to call this Twitch event sub event dot TS, right? Now, remember, we already have the Twitch sub or the Twitch event sub, which is what stores our subscription ids and stuff like that but that's just for getting twitch event sub subscriptions this is going to be the event sub event and like what data related to that we're going to store so let's go events oh that was kind of cool um don't api gateways become massive code bases no no that's the exact point of an api gateway is is to not be a massive code base um, an API gateway really should just be something that has a schema that is uh, structured against endpoints. Um, and so, for example, like, you know, you have a slash, you know, Redis slash keys endpoint, and that will go to Redis for you using, you know, the gateway to, uh, yeah, think controller. Yeah, think controller. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So we've got our Twitch sub event. Honestly, I have not created an entity in like forever. <laughs> so I'm just going to go to one that we already have. As a matter of fact, I'll just go to this one here and we will start registering some of this. So, um, remember I'm using type GraphQL, Uh, and so we are, are using like decorators and like all these other things just because it's very type GraphQL centric. Um, but at the end of the day, we're really just setting up the table in the database or the schema for it. So we have our entity. This is going to be called uh, Twitch event sub event, right? Um, now here, here's the thing, right? We've got indexes. Now I'm going to have to create a bunch of index. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, door, door's here. Give me one second, guys. You'd love to see me implement the uh, API gateway? Yeah, I mean, we will. We absolutely will stick around. <laughs> eventually, at some point, we're going to be doing. I mean, eventually, at some point, I would like to like sell Quirk for you know like maybe a few million, and then like the real goal here would just be like, hey, Twitch, you know all those things that like don't really work super well for you. Guess what? I made the entire platform for you. Just buy it. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're still making something for us too, so it's still something we need. Okay, so Twitch sub event. Uh, let's get rid of that for now. Oh, you know what? No, we do need that one. Yeah. So type and user ID need to be unique. So what this index here tells us is that users cannot have the same two types of entries. Um, and so if we go to event sub here, we're missing something. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Thank you. Thank you um type here it is yeah so type so let's grab this since we know we're going to need this um now this is actually the same yeah these types actually do match yeah because this event sub subscription type is the event so 
it will be stream online here just like it is stream online here yeah so this this enum is is fine this is this is fine it's not empty column okay so we register an enum called event sub subscription type here excuse me and then we reuse it in other places i'm wondering do i have to register this more than once or can i just register it in one place and then call it a day i'm just gonna leave that like that for right now because i'm not too sure if i need to register that more than once um okay so column all right so we've got id we've got column we've got the index which binds it so that they're unique uh event whoops uh, nope that's not the one i want event yep okay id 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 field okay so this is gonna be i a z if uh, yeah id right there and uh, duh, 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 duh. we need the user relation so that we know who this is owned by we'll add that right we'll do this and then we will do that now again like i actually you know it is as as clunky as open or as type graphql has felt in some regards to me um like i i don't i don't know i have mixed feelings about decorators but this really isn't like a terrible way of of doing this like i i really don't mind this too much um okay so i don't think there's anything else we need from this yeah there's nothing else we need from that okay so let's take a look and like, like let's see what we've got so far so we have created our twitch event sub event entity right and it is a it's got an object type for type graphql so it'll be generated as a type graphql schema too um it will have its entity generated for it with the name or the the table uh or the the uh, yeah the table is yeah, the table yeah the table uh name twitch event sub event our index on every entry will be type and user id at least so the idea here is is that no user can have the same type twice now they can have multiple types they just can't have the same type twice which is exactly how we want that to work that's going to be in this case unique um and so after that we say twitch sub event base entity which is my entity that i created um we got the id of the actual column or the entry the row whatever the type which is the same enum field user all that stuff okay is uuid okay cool all right so at this point we need to add our other columns which is like our discord channel id discord channel enabled all of that stuff and it looks like we have a couple things that we can probably reference from so the first thing is the discord channel id um human hum, uh hmm verification discord bot verification verification you hmm. discord bot discord bot okay so on the discord bot if we go to discord bot right we will see somewhere in here about hmm, guild id groups system messages verification okay here we go so you see all these down here like verification message id all of this this is what we can copy uh because we already know how we handle discord stuff um so uh how do i create it at okay yeah so yeah so we'll do this and then we will change this from verification channel id to discord channel id right and again pretty much everything else is is standard um we know that it's a field it's nullable potentially it's optional uh it's not bound by anything like a uuid or something like that so we just need to make sure that it's got something there um and and yeah null true so there we go discord channel id string or null uh what else we got uh discord enabled so this this one is required 
Um, so here's what we can do. We could say field like this, column like this, and then say in uh, Discord enabled Boolean, just like that. And then that's all we need for that because Booleans are required in this case. Okay. Um, Discord channel, Discord enabled. Cool. Okay, so now we're requiring this um, column. We should probably set a default here as well, right? So let's say that the default here is false. So by default, we're not going to enable. We're not going to enable our Discord stuff. Um, okay. So what we want to do then is is we want to grab message because we already handle messages. Welcome message. So this can be discord message field string nullables optional length two. So we say, Hey, you need at least to be able to put two characters in your, uh, your go live notification for discord text. Yep. And it's a text column. Good. Varchar. Good. Okay, good. Um, yep. There you go. Um, and I'm re but yeah, I'm rebuilding a, uh, I'm basically, I'm rebuilding our go live notification flow. So whenever a user goes live, uh, we can process that for our users, uh, in Twitch or from Twitch. Um, yeah. Okay. So there we go. So we've got discord channel ID, discord enabled discord message. Now we don't have an index yet, right? We don't have anything saying like, Hey, if this is not described or anything like that error, we'll worry about that in a second. Cause we just want to get the other things in there. So we've got LifeX enabled and Twitter enabled. And to make our lives a little bit easier, we can literally just do this and this, and then we'll just change this to Twitter. T W I T T E R. There we go. And what was the other one again? Lift. Oh wait, no, sorry. LifeX. LifeX enabled and then Twitter enabled as well, right? So we know at the bare minimum, we're going to need those. So we could just copy and paste those to make our lives a little easier. Uh, and then LifeX scene ID and Twitter text. Um, and we could change Twitter text to Twitter message just so that it follows the same, like enabled message, enabled message. Um, so we're going to go here. Oops. Uh, oops. Nope. Nope. There we go. We're going to go here and we're going to say after Twitter enabled, uh, Twitter message. That's good. And that's nullable as well. And then LifeX scene ID. Now LifeX scene, LifeX scene state scene, uh, stream alert. Yeah, there we go. stream C yeah so this right here stream scene id this will make it so that it will validate lifex ids properly so if we do this and we just change it to lifex scene id like that then that will reference the lifex scene id except this needs to be or null because this is optional so uh nullable true and then we also need to add it here where we say uh here boop boop uh string nullable true there we go okay cool so we now have uh our entire entity created so what do we got we got our discord channel id which is string or null it's nullable but you need to at least have one or up to 25 characters to fill, uh, to store to the database properly. It needs it to be optional. So if we try validating and it's not there at all, that's fine. Um, same thing with discord or not same thing, but the next thing is discord enabled. Uh, we set the default to false. Um, and then we say that, um, if it, if it's created, it's just, in, yeah, it's just false by default. Uh, okay. So discord message is a text column. Uh, field string nullable. Yep. Nullable string. Yep. That's good. Lifex required defaulted to false. Yep. That's fine. Um, 
simply affects scene ID, right? This is uh, this is nullable as well. UUID four. Yep, all that's good. Twitter enabled. That's required, but set to false by default. And the Twitter message is is that as well. Type event sub. So it uses the enum. Yep, and then our user as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So our entity now at least is wired up so that we have it in uh, in in basically the API service. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to write a migration for it and then we need to, um, push this code up so that the database can be migrated in Kubernetes. Um, so let's do that. So let's do Doppler setup really quickly so that I switch over to the dev stuff. Um, and then let's shoot, I'm trying to think of what needs to be done next. Um, so we have the entity, right? We just did that. So if I go to events, sub event, this should be good. Let's see if we can build really quickly. TSC no emit. Cool. So we can build. That's good. Um, so we don't have any computation errors. Um, so at this point, this exists in the di or in the logic as schema. It hasn't been migrated yet. Okay, so let's do that. So let's do type ORM. Okay, so I don't know how to create migrations with type ORM. I forget how to do that. So type ORM create migration. Migrations type ORM. How migrations work, create a new migration. Creating a new migration, pre-write, installing a CLI. Yeah, shut up. Here we go. Type ORM migration create dash N. Okay, so that is what it is. Type ORM. Oh, here, let's do this. NPX type ORM. There we go. Uh, migration create. Is it? Yeah, creates a new migration. Creates a new migration file with SQL needs to be executed to update schema. Yeah, of course, man. Have a good one. Enjoy yourself. So I've always just created a new migration. Um, we'll just keep it that way. Uh, okay, so this is Twitch event sub event. And this is the Twitch event sub event uh, table migration. Where did that create that? Oh, I created it here. Lame. All right, but we can move it. Source my, oops, nope. Migration V. There we go. Twitch event sub event. Cool. Okay, so we have now created a migration for it. So let's go to this migration. So if you're curious on what exactly this is or what, like what I'm doing, um, as I said before, one of the main concerns I have with any data in Quirk is that I just want to make sure it's easily manageable. You know what I mean? I don't want to like hate my life uh, trying to manage uh, data and stuff. Um, and so what we do whenever we implement, um, whenever we implement new tables in the database or make changes like this and stuff like that, we create migrations for them. And these migrations are run uh, atomically. They're able to run across the database and make these changes whenever we have them. And as a matter of fact, you'll notice we already have a lot of migrations. Uh, we have quite a bit of migrations. Um, and that's that's purposeful. That's because I've made a lot of changes and structure updates to the database. Um, but we want to make sure that we are doing this uh, right for our, our new table. And so Twitch event sub, we're going to grab this. And the reason why is because we need mm, actually hold on we might need to grab a later or an earlier one update twitch event sub yeah okay so i actually need the update one update twitch event sub twitch yeah there we go okay so here what we're gonna do is we're going oh, actually no 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 my bad twitch uh, twitch event sub yeah, this migration. All right, so we're gonna grab this migration first. 
Uh, the migration here on the left here, let, let me make a little bit more room for you so you can see it. Uh, so this migration here is an older migration of the Twitch event sub table. Right now we're creating the Twitch event sub event table. But if you recall, we had a lot of very similar things like foreign keys to the user. Um, the type it, the type enum is identical, like things like that. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are essentially creating it the same way for our, our other new uh, our other new table. So I'm going to copy that block of code and just paste it in like this, right? Now, what this means is that it's just literally doing exactly what it was doing in the other file, but I have a lot of the like work in place for what I want to do. So what we'll do is, is we'll change this to Twitch event sub event. Um, and then what I'm going to do is, is Twitch event sub event. I'm going to open it up on the right pane here so that I know what all I need, right? So by default, uh, in our columns, right? We know that we have our UUID. That's always consistent. Um, and then the next thing after that, we have our Discord channel ID. Um, okay, so for this, we grabbed these values from the Discord bot migrations. So let's see. His, yeah, here we go. Discord message, welcome message, bot. So here's this. So add column, verification channel ID, verification message. Okay, yeah, so this is all we need. Now, what we can do is, is we can just grab this part. We don't really need like the external stuff, but this stuff we do want. Um, and so I'm going to do this. Yo, thank you for the follow. And I'm going to paste that in right there. Um, but remember, this isn't exactly how we named it. So we're going to want to make sure that we change this to Discord channel ID, right? And is, is it unique? Uh, no, so we can get rid of that. It is nullable, however, right? Yeah, so it is nullable. Um, name, Discord channel ID, and type varchar. Um, cool. Okay, so that that's good. Um, then we want discord enabled. Now this one again is pretty, pretty straightforward. I should just be able to do, uh, name discord enabled type Boolean Boolean. Is it, is it Boolean? Can I actually say Boolean? I think so. Um, and we'll say is I think is nullable is false by default. So I think that's all you need. Discord enabled. And remember, we then said, well, we've got that a couple more times. So let's go ahead and get that in there those other times. So we've got Discord enabled. We've got LiveX enabled. And then we've also got uh, Twitch or no, Twitter, right? Yeah, Twitter, Twitter enabled. Oops. Twitter enabled. <laughs> Pork gyros and freshly baked bread. Absolutely. Over over the two, as much as I love TypeScript, I'm going to have to say pork gyros. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> delicious right now. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds amazing. I appreciate your question. All right, so let's go down here. Let's delete all of this. The user ID will stay there. All right, so we're getting a little bit closer to what we need. Um, so we've got Discord channel, Discord enabled. We need the Discord message. Human verification. Human verification. Uniques. What's interesting is Discord bot. Uh, let's look for migration. Migration, Discord bot. Yeah, let's look at all of these. So human verification, system messages, welcome message, group relation, guild, group, Discord bot. Does that mean I already had it here? No. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, I was like, dude, there's no way. There's, there's no way. Verification message ID. 
it's not human mer verification I'm thinking of. What's the other thing we use channel IDs or channel messages for currently? The welcome. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so we want this as well. We want this for the uh, message. So we're going to go back to here. Oops, sorry. I meant here. Uh, we're going to do this. And then we're going to paste in that. And this is just Discord message uh, text. Discord message text. Yeah. Discord message text is nullable and it is nullable. True. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, interesting. So I want to look up another one, which is I'm trying to essentially one of the reasons why I'm being very deliberate on the types I'm using and things like that is, is because this migration is going to set up what type ORM expects. And so if I don't write this migration correctly, there is a chance that I could potentially, um, I could potentially like not have matching types or something else. And then I got to like revert the migration and stuff like that. So we're, we're just going to make sure that we do it right. <laughs> Um, Discord channel ID is nullable. Discord channel ID is nullable. Yep. Column Discord enabled Boolean. Discord enabled Boolean. Yep. Is nullable. True. Name Discord message. Discord message. Yep. LifeX enabled. LifeX scene ID. Okay. So we need the scene ID. Um, so I think what we're going to do is, is, yeah, I think, I think it's just this. I think we just do this, this, this this lifex scene id right and then here we say is nullable true yeah there we go so we've got discord channel id discord enabled discord message lifex enabled lifex scene id twitter enabled right and then twitter message as well so same thing is here and here Twitter met or oh whoops so for this needs to be Twitter message okay so we're getting closer the next thing we need to do is our type and I think that's it yeah I think that's it now remember I told you guys that I want to make sure I have the up-to-date types so we're gonna want to go to migration and then we're gonna go to uh, update yeah, this one right here, um, because this is the enum that we actually want uh, right here. Type. Yeah, name. Okay, so we'll say uh, enum. So it knows how to populate the enum. And then we'll say name, type, and then type enum yeah thank you for the follow there we go all right so now we've got an enum that is a part of this type or that is a part of this uh as well awesome and that should be that should be the right one okay all right so i think that's pretty close to at least like the basics of the table so we've got again the id discord channel id which is nullable the Discord uh, enabled, which is not nullable in a Boolean, uh, is nullable for Discord message. LifeX enabled, not nullable. LifeX scene ID nullable. Uh, Twitter enabled, not nullable. Twitter message nullable. Message, message. Okay, cool. And then our enum right here, which has everything that we would expect. And then the user ID. Okay, cool. Any experience with Vue.js and opinions on it? Um, Vue. I'm trying to remember if I liked Vue. Yeah, I liked Vue. Uh, Vue had good tooling. I, I thought Vue had really good tooling. In all seriousness, I just use React because I've worked with it ever since it literally came out. And I'm comfortable with it. And I can move very fast with it. And I've made a lot of money doing things in React. Um. I have used Vue. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a repository on the internet 
if you go to our uh our github our personal or our, like the company github i guess uh github alt f4 i made a uh examples example argo cd oh maybe it, maybe i deleted it um sample web frameworks yeah um in this i evaluated all of them angular phoenix react svelte Vue. um and then i i wrote uh my thoughts on them here you go i forgot i wrote my thoughts on them but yeah if you want to know my opinions on all of these feel free to look at that Okay, so yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, okay, cool. So I think we're getting like close enough to where we need to start solving much more complicated problems now. Uh, the first one that's going to be a bit more complicated is, well, not yet, not yet, not yet. I guess we can do a couple other things. Migration, uh, verification uniques, uh, event subtopics. Okay, so table foreign key. Okay, so we need to create a foreign key really quickly. Um, we need to create our relation to our user. So we need to go here. And then after we create the table, we're going to create a foreign key to our user between the tables. This will be Twitch event sub event. We're going to create a foreign key on. The column names in this case is going to be user ID. The referenced is going to be ID. And then the reference column or the reference table is going to be user. And now it will not only create our table in the database, here right but it'll also make sure that we've got that foreign key there as well uh what what do you mean you expected that oh because it's okay gotcha yeah it's it's that one gotcha okay um okay so we've got our enum which was important we got our foreign key which was important and we've got the main schema which was important there's a couple things that we can also do, uh, which is uh, we can get rid of our foreign or basically take care of our reversion process. Um, and if you don't know what that is, uh, essentially, um, it's when we want to uh, revert a migration. So in the circumstance of like a migration happens, uh, we want to make sure that we can revert it if need be. And so to do that, we do something like this where we, we say like, all right, well, let's go ahead and get the table in question. In this case, it would be Twitch event sub event. And before you can delete data, you have to delete like the foreign keys and stuff like that. And so we say, okay, well, if we have our table that exists, when we do our migration revert, before we drop the table, we say, okay, well, table, in this case, foreign keys, find any foreign keys. And if there are a foreign key, or if there is a foreign key, then we drop it on that specific, uh, that specific table. This makes it so that if we have relational data anywhere in the database, it can safely disconnect itself from that data and remove it by removing that foreign key. Um, so we, we have to make sure that we do this. Otherwise, the it, it won't work. Um, but once we do that, then we just do something as simple as just drop the table uh, because we don't have any more relations to it. So there we go. Now we have our revert written as well. So Twitch event sub event. There we go. Now our revert or our down is written too. So when we do up or when we run our migration, it will create our new table and add a foreign key to it from our user or to our user. And then on revert, it will drop the foreign key and then drop the table itself. Um, 
that feeling when you work in software engineering for so long that you start cashing your opinions. I mean, that's basically YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's basically YouTube. Uh, may I ask what IDE editor you are using? Is this Linux? Uh, this is NeoVim and I use Arch. Um, if you're curious in like, you know, uh, my dot files or anything like that, you can do exclamation mark dot files in chat, check out the video, um, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, that's really it. Yeah, I would I would recommend checking out the dot files video if you're interested in how I've got my setup and stuff. Um, dope. Okay, so this migration is close to being done. Now it's not entirely done because we actually have to go back here now, right? And uh, then why don't you use global status and NeoVim? What? What? Uh, because I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, dude, because I don't, but I, I think I've heard of it, but like, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I use NeoVim to the point to where it makes good, uh, it enables me to make good software. Uh, and I tweak it on my own. Is that like the global status line? I don't, yeah, I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, or I might, and I forgot. Okay. So we need to, we need to do. I don't know if this is indexing or like how. Hmm. I need to look at some other uh, global status line. Yeah, yeah, that's that's recent, dude. That came out like literally two weeks ago. Uh, so because I haven't moved to it yet, <laughs> it's not. It's only it's only been out pretty recently, from what I know. So uh, I'll take a look at it when I can. Yeah. Um, verification system message. So, dang, we need a use case where we have validation that's a bit tricky. Hmm. Many to many column interesting I need to think about is it hmm many to many migrations relations I'm I think these are indexes that I need to create, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. But I think we need to create some indexes that know how to handle when like something's set a certain way. Right. And so the idea is, is that like, if we like, if first name is set to true, then this would also need to be true as well. Um, I just don't, I haven't done this in a while, so I don't really remember how to do it with SQL. Um, and I, I could have sworn we had like use cases somewhere in here, um, but I don't know where. And that's the challenging part is, is I have no idea where that would be. Entity command uh, notification reputation. Hmm. User type, user Twitch, OAuth. Um, interesting. So how do we solve this problem? I think that's going to be the next question is how do we solve this problem of making sh now, I mean, I guess we could just write it in the logic, right? But if the logic's wrong, then it could still write it to the database. Uh, Postgres, uh, Postgres must be uh, non-null when true or something like that. That's right. We need constraints, I think. I think we need constraints. Uh, okay, that's the word I was looking for. Constraints. Here we go. Entity constraint keys. 
validate entity constraints, constraint keys. But this is for class validator, right? Like this doesn't, hmm, that still doesn't solve my problem. So let's do type ORM constraints. Yeah. That's fine. The unique constraint, yeah, that's fine. Multiple columns, no, that's fine. Foreign keys, check. Check constraints with type ORM. Price, okay. Uh, I use Arch, yeah, I use Arch. So this would be a pre-existing constraint though. Okay. I feel like I've done this before, but like, I don't know. Is there a guide to install it? Do exclamation mark dot files in chat. <laughs> uh, Nico, how's it going? Hello, hello. A composite, you yeah, I think this is what I'm looking for. So this will say, oh, 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 I think this is what we need. This decorator allows, okay, so maybe it is check. Okay. Allows you to create a database check constraint for a specific column or columns. This decorator can be applied only to an entity itself. So it'll check. MySQL does not check constraints. Okay. So first name, John, and last name, Doe, age greater than 18. So basically, you could not add anything to this table if you were not greater than 18, or you, yeah, if you were under 18 and your name was John Doe. Is that right? Is, am I reading this right? <laughs> am I am I reading this right? Um, I think that's right. Index. Create database index which allows you to mark columns unique. Dude, I could have sworn this is the, this is what I did. Uh, yeah. Here, sorry. Here you go. Oh, geez, Louise, what happened? There you go. Check out that video. Um. Something else. Unique. Uh, yeah. Okay. That kind of helps me. That kind of helps me. Dude, I could have sworn that there was somewhere in here that I was already doing this with. Here. I need I need to I need more window space. There it is. That's what I'm looking for. So what this is saying is that if Twitch is set to true, then, oh, it just makes it, it just makes it unique. I see. Okay. So I see. So this is kind of solving a different problem. This is making sure that these are unique. Versus what I want to do, I think, which is I want to check. Yeah, I think I just want to check. I, I think I do want to check stuff. Okay. Um, hmm. So if that's the case, then they're saying that here, decorator allows you to create a database check constraint for specific columns. This decorator can be applied only to an entity itself. Yo, what's up, Fester? How's it going, buddy? Um, first name, what does this mean? I don't know what this is supposed to mean, but, and last, so this is, oh, this is SQL, I think. 
I think this is like a form of SQL. Um, I think I might just leave this to the controller endpoint. Yo, MC Osco, how's it going? Hello, hello. I, I think this is going to be too difficult for me to try and translate this into SQL. So like SQL uh, non-null if other column is true. PostgreSQL. So I want... I'm I'm trying to determine if we look at our schema here that we've created, right? Lifex enabled, Twitter enabled. Real, what I'm trying to, I, and honestly, this may just be, it may be genuinely better to make sure that I just do this in the back end and just write it as lock or as logic. You know what I mean? Um, but what we want to do is we want to make it say like, this is not null if this is true, right? And this is more so like, I'm honestly, it's more validation endpoint logic than anything else. I think I think that's really the the thing I need to focus on is like it's just gonna need to be like I think it's just gonna be too complicated. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. So create table constraint if t attribute check not attribute or is not null. If A and B, then so it, constraint if attribute, then number is not null. Check not attribute or number is not null. So would that mean that I would have to do something like check? Um, I have no idea how to write this, but maybe something like because um, I think they put them in quotes too, right? Yeah, they put them in quotes. So quotes. Um, Discord enabled is or no equals true and Discord uh, channel ID Well, so here's the thing it's like it's like hmm That's not right. Yeah, that's not right Check attribute and number is nil Check not Attribute and number is nil so that's taking the response from attribute and number is nil and saying not against it. It's a bit strange to have these check constraints. If you want this, you should normalize. I we already had a whole conversation on why I'm not doing that yet. But yeah, you're not wrong. You're you're definitely not wrong. Um, which may just mean that I'm just not gonna worry about this right now. Like I said, it may make way more sense for me to simply just not do this until we refactor the schema and just handle it, you know, handle it in the handle it in the logic of the the controller itself. You know, don't worry about doing this with the database. Um, I, I think that's what we're going to do, because honestly, it doesn't really matter. Like my schema is going to check to see if these values exist or not. Anyways, like it will be written in a sense that it's gonna be okay if this isn't here yeah all right we'll get we'll, we're not gonna worry about the constraints right now we'll just keep it what it is because yeah i agree it's gonna be too it's gonna be too difficult um check not null if a value is true in another column the logic behind the cone here if a and if a then b is written in boolean logic as not a or b may seem counter to his for but i yeah i have no i don't i don't think i don't think this is going to work oh, whoops i don't think this is going to work postgres add constraint not null if value is another yeah let's see let's see what the oh jeez <laughs> uh okay wait hold on here we go oh no it's because they oh i see they 
they create a oh god no that's terrible <laughs> it's like you can do anything that you want with postgres but like should you <laughs> you know Oh, you know what? I think I understand their implementation now, now that I look at this. So what they're saying that not attribute. So I think what this would say is, is not A or B is the same. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm getting it now. So the challenge is we might have multiples, right? So in this, and here's where like it still isn't that great because like if we do it with this, we can only I th I, like we're going to have to do like and 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 you know what I mean? As we add more like th like BN's right. The real approach here is, is to abstract these into their own, you know, more logically scoped, you know, schemas and stuff. But because we're not doing that right now, I just don't think me trying to write constraints like this, like at the database level is going to make sense yeah I, I i don't think it is i think it's going to just be too challenging and yeah i mean age greater than 18 john doe i don't really see a good way of doing this yeah um, okay, so if that's the case, then let's just keep this like this. Uh, we should at this point have a few new things, right? We have our entity, which is our Twitch event sub event, Twitch event sub event, right? Type user ID unique, all that good stuff. Discord channel ID, Discord enabled, Discord message, LeFX enabled, LeFX scene ID, Twitter enabled, Twitter message, type user, yeah. So I think there's one other thing we need to do really quickly, which is I think if we go to entity and we go to Twitch event sub event, uh, entity Twitch event sub, I think this needs to be registered. I, I think it has to be done twice because I think this is going to be name, subscription, subscription type. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious if this would actually work or not. We will find out in a second though. Type ORM register, register enum type. Do you not have to do that anymore? Oh, no, it looks like you don't. Yeah, no. Okay, so I guess I don't. I only have to do this once. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think we're good. I think we've pretty much got everything that we need, at least in the database uh, or at least in the API from a schema perspective. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're done working with the API yet because we have to think about what is going to be loaded into the front end um and if we think about that if we go here we go here we'll see that we make a call to get the go live oh that was you um we get the go live discord right like so forth and so on so what we're going to need to do now now that we've got the schema in place we actually need to set up the queries uh and stuff like that and so that is done in here uh, where we provide a bunch of inputs and then we create our uh, graphs essentially for those queries. Um, and so you can see here service queries and then we start setting up the fields that we make queries against. And so we've got like command 
And we should have Twitch event sub. Okay, so I guess maybe it's not a service one. Um, but if we go down here, Twitch channel reward, Twitch bots, we can just like grab this bots one or I guess, yeah, let's grab, let's grab the bots one. Yeah. So grab this one. We'll go past Twitch channel reward and then we will say here, Twitch event sub event, right? Yo, studio JVLA. How's it going? Hello. Hello. Um, get rid of this logger. We don't need this. And instead of this being Twitch bot, uh, we want it to return a singular, not an array of Twitch event sub event, right? And you'll see that that is a entity that we can now use. So what's going to happen is this will become something that I can query in GraphQL. Um, now we need to think about what we need. So I'm going to say Twitch event sub event find, and we're going to say find one here, right? Um, now we need to think about what is going to be required. Now I think we need two things really, right? We'll go ahead and grab this, put this here. And the two things I think we're going to need for our Twitch event sub event, uh, is going to be, let's see, Twitch event sub event partial, right? Uh, oh, input. Whoops. Input. Uh, and then it's going to be the type, which we want to be our Twitch event sub event sub event, or is it, what is the type on this? Uh, shoot, hold on. I don't remember what the, what is it? Event sub subscription type. Ah, okay. So then event sub sub subscription type there's our enum and then the other thing we want besides our enum is our user id yeah field user id event sub or no, sorry, this would just be a string. My bad. This is just a string. Yeah. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that our serve. Remember how we were just working on. Um... What happened? Yo, what's up, Studio JVLA? How's it going? Thank you so much for the raid. I appreciate it. How's your stream? First name not and last name not. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. What did you just delete? Oh, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I see. Um, okay, so uh do uh do event sub event. Yeah. So our services now should be able to use the user ID as well as the type of event sub event for us to look it up in the database and get that data. Um, cool. Okay. So let's go back to events, sub events right here. There we go. There's our input. We don't need these anymore. Instead, we're going to want our type and our user ID. Um, and then here we need to change this to Twitch event, sub event input like that. Um, and so where is going to be type and user ID. Uh, we're not going to worry about relations. We don't need to worry about that at all. Uh, we will just simply put that right there. Okay, cool. So what have we just done? We just wired up the back end call for, uh, for requesting Twitch event sub events. Uh, I'm using NeoVim. Yeah. If you guys are curious about my dot files, you can do exclamation mark dot files in chat. I highly recommend it. I made a pretty good video on how you can achieve a lot of this yourself. Okay. So we've got the Twitch sub event. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, we've got the Twitch sub event 
wired up. So that means, is it possible on Mac OS? It's possible that you can't use my automation, right? So if you watch the video, I walk you through in 15 minutes, how you can set it up yourself. Um, and I just talk about in the video where I'm like, Hey, you know, if you're on a different computer, this is going to be different. Um, but I will tell you this trend, you can do the same thing that I'm doing. You can still use Ansible. You could still like all the same processes that I do to get to where I am. You can do, um, you just have to write it for Mac OS. Like I, I only use Linux, so I only really care about that for me. Um, or in the future, I'll make it so that my dot files have more support. Um, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you like, if you don't want all the automation, you can just grab the files. Um, and if you're curious, if you do go to my dot files, like the actual repository itself, um, there is, uh, there's there again, there's a video attached to it, but if you go to roles, roles is where all of the like tasks and configurations for everything. So that's why you'll see like I three K nines, kitty NeoVim. And if you click on NeoVim and you go to like files, you'll see like my whole configuration. So if you're, you know, if you want to like steal a specific thing, then you could easily just go in here and like yoink that. But if you really want to learn like how to, again, like automate and, and really like do what I'm doing, which is a completely different thing, you know, um, then I would recommend watching the video and, and try building it yourself because I, I definitely think it's, it's hundred percent possible. I know it's possible. It's just my specific dot files are really only meant to work on on uh, arch like literally only on arch <laughs> um eventually in the future i might make it support more things but i don't like i'm not really trying to make it support more things if that makes sense <laughs> you know what i mean like it's more for me uh and then i show you guys how i do it you know okay so we've got our event sub event now where we can query event sub events um but we also we also chat right we also need to be able to do this uh, for our users. So this isn't just something that our uh, services are going to query, but it is something that our users are going to query. Um, now, what's interesting about this one, however, is uh, what's up, stupid kid, by the way. How you doing, buddy? Um, one thing that is interesting, however, is in this scenario, we're authenticated. We have something called a context, right? You see here context. Um, that context means that we've already logged in and like the user, like we don't have to check for the user ID. We already know who the user is. Uh, it's the user logged in. So we should be able to, on this side, save some time with some of these things, but Twitch event sub event. There we go. Twitch event sub event here. Uh, this could be nullable. So that's actually something else we need to make sure we do, which is we say here, nullable is also true. It's been a while since we've wired up stuff to the database chat. It's kind of crazy. Um, how's your stream, by the way, JVLA? What did you, uh, what did you end up working on? Sorry, I didn't mean to get super distracted there. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, my brain is like processing code in the back of my mind while I'm also talking. <laughs> Switch event, sub event, where... Okay, so this is good in the sense that this is the user ID and that's automatically injected, but we still need to add input to this as well. So you see here where it says like args input, input, uploads, input. We need that input still too. Um, so we need to go here and we're just going to copy both of these lines really quickly. Boom. Twitch channel rewards. That's not what we want. Twitch bot isn't what we want. This is what we want. Yeah. All right. So we're going to delete all of this and don't worry. Don't worry. It's coming back. There we go. All right. There we go. So now we've got args and context. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to change this to Twitch input, right? And then Twitch event sub input uh, next. Yep. And then we are going to literally oh gosh come on control c <laughs> uh there we go going to copy that we're going to go here and instead we're going to go to twitch channel reward input yeah you go twitch event sub and we don't need the user id we just want the type there we go and so in the front end we will pass off the type that we want to get so when we're in the front end and i click go live that will send up just the type 
via the front end routes, which are already authenticated. I don't have to worry about like, oh, is this user allowed to access this or whatever? Um, it's all it's all wired together. So um, we'll say user ID uh, and then we'll say type. Uh, yeah, like that. And then this will be type. Oh, nope, 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 nope. Sorry, nope, there we go. Uh, const equals input. And then this will be our type input that is required, right? So there we go. So now, right now, we've got everything that we need. Um, yeah, now we've got everything that we need. Okay, so the front end can make queries now to the back end to get the latest. Um, I'm going to do something really quickly slash logger. All of these like logger debug things, I'm deleting them. Go away. Go away. Go away. I did this a long time ago and it was a really stupid idea. <laughs> That's basically the TLDR on it. Don't do like overly complicated, stupid logging. Just do something that's like easy. God, I did these everywhere. Oops. Uh, that's fine. That's not fine. That's not fine. That's fine though. Yeah. Those ones are fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, what about here? Do we have a bunch of them here? Yeah, we do. Oops. Why did I do this dude? Oh, geez. Hello, Goonies. How's it going? Oh, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. Cool. And then we can get that rid of that entirely. Okay, awesome. Do you think it's necessary to learn CSS if I want to dedicate myself to front end? Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's unfortunate, but yep, you got to do it. Got to learn it. Do you have to be a master at it? No, but you got to know it. You got to be able to talk the talk. It's a language. As long as you can talk the language, you're fine. Uh, Twitch event sub event, nullable true. Twitch event sub event. Yep. Yep. So again, we grab the data or the user. Sorry. We grab... We grab the user from the context as we want to, right? Check to see if it's there. If it's not, we say bye-bye. Then we grab the input and we say what kind of input we want or what type. And then we check to see if we have a Twitch event sub event for that user with that type. Um, yeah, that looks good. Okay, so there's a couple other things we need to do before we're done wrapping up or uh, doing the API stuff. The first one's going to be, we need to go to our user and where we do Twitch bot, uh, we want to CP Twitch bot and change this to Twitch event sub event dot GraphQL. The reason why we're doing this is because this, and we're going to actually CP, actually, hold on, let's go to service, CP user Twitch event sub event dot GraphQL. Now, what these files are, are the actual GraphQL, if I type GraphQL and then I do Twitch event sub event user and service. Yeah, see this right here, event sub service. Switch this. So what this is, is this is the schema that I'm telling GraphQL I want it to return from the database or from the server essentially. So what I'm saying is, is hey, for user uh, queries to Twitch, event sub event uh twitch event sub event then i want to get back the id the uh the uh what else the id the discord channel id if it exists we want to get the discord message right we want to get discord enabled 
right? We want to get that back. Uh, we want to get LifeX enabled. We want to get LifeX seen ID. Uh, we need to get our Twitter enabled, right? And then our Twitter uh, message, right? Now we don't need like the I the actually we don't even need the ID really. We just we just care about this stuff. Yo, Cassie Dev, how's it going? Um, so yeah, so Discord channel ID. Okay, uh, let's do this as well because I'm like slightly confused uh, on what these should all be. Uh, Twitch. All right, there we go. So Discord enabled, Discord channel ID, Discord channel ID, Discord enabled, Discord message. Got it. LifeX enabled. Got it. LifeX scene ID. Got it. Twitter enabled. Got it. Twitter message. Got it. Type. That is a part of the query, so I don't really care too much about that. And also is the user ID. So remember, whenever we do a query for a user Twitch event sub event, there are two things that we do. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, we need to include those. Um, and so what we need to do is, is we need to say input, and then we need to say what this is. Um, ooh, I don't remember how to do this. Input, input. Yeah, so it looks like this. So it's input and then it's like user Twitch event sub event input. Although I don't know if that's entirely accurate. User activate user. Yeah, and so then we do this. We map the input to input like that, I think. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, Chad. It's been a while since I've written these documents, so I'm gonna do this. Yeah, okay. So it is here, and it is here. Okay. So let's go back to our user query. And I think somewhere in here, okay, service query. Yeah, you see this service command input? We need to do the same thing for our service call thingy that we just made. So Twitch input, Twitch bots input. Here it is. So this input type needs to actually have the name of service Twitch Twitch event sub event. And the reason for that is, is because you can't have the exact same name input twice. And it, what it would try to do because they have the same class name is it would try and give it the name Twitch event sub event input uh, for both and they would conflict. So we need for the user perspective. Uh, so if I go back to GraphQL uh, service, for example, and then do um, Twitch event sub event like this right what this is is this is the service one so we would type service twitch event sub event input right uh and to make sure we've got exactly what we need we can just do this Oop. and then put service in front of it and so that'll make sure that it knows how to differentiate which input is which uh and so this actually needs to be service Twitch event, and then this needs to be service as well. And so that'll make sure that services use their own inputs versus uh, front ends that use their own inputs. So service, Twitch event, sub event, input. Yeah, this looks good. Okay, so let's go to user, Twitch, event, sub event. Yep, and then we will just paste this in its place. And wherever it says service, we want to replace it with user. There we go. Hello, can someone give me a rundown on what's happening? Just join and it seems cool. Yeah, so anybody just tuning in, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I am working on something called Quirk. Quirk is a Stream Element Streamlabs competitor. Essentially, we build a streamer tools platform here. That's one of the things that we do here. Um, it's completely self-hosted. Uh, we've been building it for the past two years and we have focused entirely building this platform for really us. Um, we have friends who use it. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different streamers who use it as well, um, but the the main you know bottom line of what we've been doing with it has always been like let's build the best features and tools for us 
Um, and out the gate, like there are things that you can do in Quirk that you can you can't do in other places, and there are things that you can't do in Quirk that you can do in other places because Quirk was also really meant for like let's build not only really cool tools and really cool features, but let's build features that don't exist. Things like whenever time, for example, there you go, changing the lights. Uh, that's something that we never saw anywhere as like a tool and a feature that you could just integrate with. We built that um, as well as a bunch of other things. And so uh, right now, Quirk connects to Discord, right? LiftX, Twitch, and Twitter. And so just with that thought alone, you can kind of imagine that, you know, we integrate with these platforms or providers and we, you know, we work with them. Um, yes, this is extensible. Yeah. As a matter of fact, another thing that we do is uh, we integrate with something called Twitch Event Sub. And if you don't know what Twitch Event Sub is, essentially it's how Twitch processes all of its internal events to developers. Um, and we, we integrate with that. So like if a streamer goes live, if a follower, you know, follows a channel, channel port redemption, we get all of those messages that are sent to our internal system and routed through. I would be, I'm going to be real with you times car. Um, I would check out our wiki. Um, if you're, you know, if you're new to the channel, don't really know what's going on. Um, we have, we do have a wiki on the internet. Um, it's, it's for our community. It's not just for me, but it's for our whole community. Um, and whenever I, uh, post a, or whenever I do a show, we post Twitch streams. So you can kind of go through all of the past shows and see like, oh, you know, last show we automated cork buckets. Okay, cool. We talk about that. And one of the things that I definitely do here is um i do a lot of documentation for you guys so that you can like you know have decent context and stuff um but we also have like technical design sections and things like that so yeah i, I would recommend if you're if you're really interested in the project taking a look at the wiki um but yeah right now i'm, I'm really just working on getting things uh set up for our our feature that we're building and bringing back to life uh and actually i would even say improving a bit which is our Twitch notifications. And so the idea here is, is like, you'll be able to come in here and be like, okay, go live, do this, right? When I go live, I want you to send a Discord message. When I go live, I want you to change my lights and do, and eventually it'll be even more. Like when I go live, send this over Instagram, do this on TikTok, do this, do that, right? Like this is all part of why Quirk is so extensible is we wanna make it so that like you can easily do these things. Um, Uh, yeah, I use i3 gaps. Yeah, mm -hmm. I use i3 gaps. So we're building this out right now, and I'm I'm wiring up the API layer to the data layer. Essentially, uh, we use GraphQL here, right? Oh, I did not mean to do that. Um, user uh, check. Yeah, let's get rid of that. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, we use GraphQL here as well as type ORM. So there are two steps that we have to take when we talk about. Um, adding new tables and new data to the database, which is first at the very, very low level, we have to create um, a new entity, which is this right here. And so you see, we have like all these new object types, ID, our new columns, all the columns set up and how they're supposed to be validated and their types. After that, we then wire in the actual GraphQL uh, schema, right? So we say, okay, um, we want a new input type with a type and a user ID as values. And then we go all the way down to where we created our new one and we say, all right, well, we have a new Twitch event sub event query that you can make with the Twitch event sub event being possibly null, right? And then we, we give it that Twitch event sub event input that we created above so that, um, you know, so that if, uh, it needs, we can give it the values that we need. And again, we wire this up for the services so that services can pro provide types and user IDs, whereas the users themselves, they can only look up via types because we don't want users to look up other users, Twitch event, sub event data, right? We only want users to look up their own. And so that's why in the front end, we grab the context, which has the user session in it. And then says like, Hey, if we don't have a user, you're not allowed to go any further, but if it does, then we take that user ID from the session, inject it into the query, and then make the make the uh, make the you know the call. Um, and so yeah, we we wired both of those up, um, 
And then, like I told you, we because this is GraphQL, we actually have to generate the schema files. So query, we have to tell it what kind of query we want to use. And so for our service Twitch event sub events, we want the input of service Twitch event sub event input. And then for our service schema, we return a new Twitch sub e or Twitch event sub event uh, object with the Discord channel, all the you know all the values that we're storing in the database. And you'll see here that these two are almost identical. The only thing is, is that this is for the service queries and this is for the user queries. Um, so yeah, that's that essentially makes it so that they're they are truly separate requests to the to the service. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to create a new branch here. We're going to say feature um, stream uh, Twitch notifications, um, and then we're going to say feature um, implement Twitch uh, Twitch notifications schema uh or, or actually here's what we'll say we'll say schema for twitch notifications yeah do exclamation mark uh, dot files in chat we actually have a youtube video on it if you guys are interested in how i have my dot files set up check out the youtube video yeah mm -hmm. yeah no worries be sure to check out our youtube in general i mean it's we got we got we got a lot of data on the internet for you guys chat we got the wiki so if you ever miss anything in particular, you can easily just go through the Ricky. If you want to, if you missed a Twitch stream, bam, all of them are right here. If you missed a technical document that I made, bam, they're all right here. Um, then also with the Twitch streams, if you go to a specific one, you'll notice that we got YouTubes. And the reason why we got YouTubes is because we have our archives channel as well. And so if you ever want to go back, watch a previous VOD, you can do that on the archives channel. Or if you want to catch any of our new stuff, that is on the new channel, the, the main one, the Alta 4 stream one. Um, so yeah. Okay, schema for Twitch notifications. So I'm just going to commit this and I'm going to... Let's push it up. Let's just push it up. Now, this is going directly to pipelines. Um, so this may fail because I essentially just wrote a whole bunch of code and didn't test any of it. Um, if... I don't have any pipeline failures. I am a legitimate God <laughs> um, because I, I really just kind of like was not paying attention. Um, but if we look at the code, this might actually be okay. Service Twitch events. So, and I, I, I wasn't serious, but Twitch events, sub event, service Twitch events, sub event. Serve, okay. Yeah. I mean, that looks good. User Twitch, su Twitch event, sub event, Twitch, su Twitch event, sub event, user Twitch. Oh, oh, that doesn't, that, Ooh, that's not right. That's not supposed to be user um my or not migration uh graph ql user uh documents oh graph ql documents user me input yeah okay yeah that's not right okay so then we need to do twitch event sub event and where this says user it needs to be just the original one. Yeah. C fix uh, GraphQL uh, proper uh, use proper input. Okay. Now I am kind of curious to see how far this went. So um, before I push this, let's see where we're at right now. So it actually built. It actually did build fine and it's running tests right now. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how far this goes. I don't have a lot of tests for the API service. So I would be kind of surprised if this failed, but it might, who knows? Uh, yeah, I, I run Circle CI at work, so I'm massively comfortable with it. Um, what's funny though, Timescar, is if you go to the wiki and then you type in Circle CI, you'll see that there is a previous stream uh, where I talk about where I evaluated a bunch of other ones, including GitHub Actions. I'm telling you, 
if you just do a little bit of searching, you could find almost every question you would ask on this stream in the wiki. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll see here that we actually had a VOD before where I talk about it. And the TLDR on it is the UI for pipelines is massively limited um, and not many controls around like restarting, things like that. Um, my goal, and I talk about it in this stream here, I'll, I'll paste this for you as well. Uh, I talk about it in that stream that, you know, the goal is, is to have really, you know, just good uh, systems around CI and CI pipelines, like how they're set up, how they run, like all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, not being able to have all the functionality I want or like having challenges around that, uh, I, I evaluated all of that. So yeah, yeah, I would recommend checking that out. Okay, so that ran and that worked, but again, it doesn't really matter because it wasn't, it didn't have the right, uh, it didn't have the right uh, input. Um, Sarwan, thank you for the follow. Uh, well, we're starting for example, you could totally do on the top right of the TEF, but I guess it's defo more limited. Restarting, for example, you can totally do. Yeah, you can, but you can only do it for a certain amount of time. I don't know if you knew that. Um, so LSP Containers is a project that I maintain for uh, NeoVim. Uh, it's a NeoVim plugin. And this is all powered by GitHub. Um, and like these, you know, it's open source, so we don't have to pay for any of it. Um, but like if you go to these, like I can't rerun something after like a certain amount of time like these i can't like this one i can here because it was the past six days and i get this button but like i believe if i go like way back here yeah see the button's gone Boop. all gone no button so like it's just like you like you may not even have known that there may have been something that you know or you may have known that but like like i can i can restart any pipeline always with circle ci <laughs> it doesn't matter you know what i mean so it's just like I didn't want a circle C I didn't want a system or I didn't want a CI system that felt like an afterthought and it just felt like an afterthought, you know, it, and it kind of is right. It's, it's a CI system that got built into an already existing, really dope repository system. But you know, they, they solve two very different problems. Circle CI is entirely just focused on the one thing, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah. Um, one problem I encounter regarding the restart is that it's hard to restart using the new push. Say I want, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Stuff like that for sure. Yep. You nailed it. Um, so one thing I am noticing chat, you know what, you know what I realize? We don't have migration tests running. We don't have, like I made a whole bunch of schema changes, right? Well, the, there are no tests in CI that are doing like migration checks right now. That's not good. Before I merge this, I don't even want to merge this until I add that because I'm not about to merge something to go against my database and just completely demolish it. Um, so yeah, I think what we're going to need to do next and really me, I'll do this offline because we've been streaming for six and a half hours now yeah i'm probably gonna call it here in the next few minutes um is i'm gonna need to add that check if that works then we're good right um and we can go through this pr a bit more and see what we've got right so what did we do what did we do let's talk about what we did here so creating a new cork worker we need to create we created the worker check for the repository done 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 now that we have everything uh start by bootstrapping the logic we can reuse uh components from other workers to recreate files uh which we did right and so we we did in fact do that um and then we talked about hey we need to create a notification schema and then to create that notification schema actually no we did that and then we sidetracked for a second and then we did uh, you know what i'm gonna have to cut that out of the vod yeah so that is one thing to note chat uh the hippo part of the stream today will not be in the vod uh and the reason for that is because i made a <sighs> we made a decision to not have any like non-owned properties by ourselves on the streams content because we didn't want to deal with like I'm I, I never in a million years would ever think I'd have problems with hippo or anything like that. But just to stay safe, um, that stuff you're only ever going to be able to catch live. So yeah, be sure to watch the stream 
uh, because the hippo related content doesn't go into the VOD uh, for that reason. So I, I won't be adding it. I won't be adding it here as well. Um, so creating the notification schema was the next thing that we did uh, where we created a new table in the database. We updated uh, schema ref or we created uh, we created a new entity in API service, right? Um, create a new API or an entity in API service. We created a new or we created a uh, new graph graph ql endpoints or graph ql queries i guess i should say queries and then create new graph ql actually it's just really just queries at the end of the day um but yeah so and then that was the other thing that we did is is once we got done you know bootstrapping our cork worker um we you know set up all the files the way that we needed to and then we realized like oh man we have no data to pull this from, so we're gonna need to we're gonna need to do that. Um, so let's look through this really quickly, just one last time. I'm gonna review this PR. So again, we're not gonna care about uh, care about any of the more complex logic of things like you know, uh, do we want to validate if you know if it's enabled or not? Do we have these or not? No, we're just gonna plain out simply say like we'll write the logic in the application to handle it the way we need to. And we'll just save the data to the database and refactor it later so that it's nicer. So uh, it'll, it's the best of both worlds. We don't have to worry about migrating until we migrate everything. We're staying in essentially the way it's been. So uh, Discord channel ID, string or null, that's good. Varchar, yep, that's good. Discord column or Discord enabled, default false, yep, that's good. Discord message, string or null, nullable, true, yep, that's good. Lifex enabled, Boolean default, set to false or false by default, that's good. Lifex scene ID, string or null, that's good. Yep, that looks good. Twitter enabled, false, that's good. Disc Twitter message, that's good. Type is good. User, okay, all of that's good. Um, okay, and so this is where our resolvers, or I guess I guess that's really what they're called, huh? Uh, resolvers, right? We have new GraphQL resolvers, and this is for our Twitch event sub event uh, schema, essentially. Um, okay, so in the service query, we added our Twitch event sub event entity. We then added a new Twitch event sub event input, which is a partial or implements a partial of Twitch sub event event. We then tell it that in the service queries, you can include the type and the user ID. As a matter of fact, both are required. Cool. We deleted a whole bunch of logs we don't need anymore. And then we added our new resolver Twitch event sub event, which takes our Twitch event sub event input, deconstructs it, sets up the where, 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 and then passes that to the Twitch sub event find one. Okay, that looks good. Um, and then we do the same thing here. Source GraphQL resolvers user query. We set that up. We have the user input, right? This one's the user one. Um, and all of this looks good, except for with users, they just give you the type. That's it. Um, and then we have our resolver right here, Twitch event, sub event, Twitch event, sub event input, user type, type user ID, user ID, Twitch event, sub event, find no one where. Cool. Okay. That looks good. Now this is, like I said, I'm not going to be able to merge this PR because I want to add the CI integration. Um, I want to add the CI integration of running my migrations in pipelines right like i told you this should be build test and then like migration test or like test unit test migration so we got to fix that that's that's got to be something that's fix fixable um but we do have our migration here that we're going to run it against and so we have the name which is twitch sub event or twitch sub or twitch event sub event sorry uh our id discord channel id is nullable true yep Discord enabled Boolean, right? Is nullable text true? Yep. 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 Oh, interesting. Nope. That, that, yeah, that's required. Yep. And that's required. Yeah. So yeah, I think we are, I think we're good. I think again, like I said, I'm going to need to, uh, I'm going to need to add that job back to CI so that I know this works well. But outside of that, I think, um, I think we're good. Um, okay, cool. So, um, I just caught a glimpse of Pulumi. Curious about your thoughts on Pulumi versus Terraform. 
So the main idea on Palumi versus Terraform is, is essentially, this is the only argument I think anybody can really have about it is if you like writing your automation in a language versus like, you know, a more configuration focused way of doing things, which really what HCL is like versus like, you know, JavaScript or Python or something else. Uh, that's what Pulumi excels at. Pulumi allows you to take a native language and then, you know, build your automation in it. Um, Terraform is fantastic when you just need to get really like simple automation going. And what I mean by simple truly is it could mean that you're still working at very high scale and have a bunch of different things, but it just means that it's simple. It means that you're not doing super crazy complex things and trying to like overcomplicate it. Uh, you're just doing very simple automation, right? Creating all maybe thousands of buckets, but it's a very simple process. So that would be my most honest opinion on the two is, you know, one is there for one use case of making things very easy and simple. Um, whereas, you know, one is like, if you really need more complexity, more abstractions, things like that, um, that can be super helpful. Um, so yeah, so all right guys, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call it here. Uh, today has been a fantastic day. We've been streaming again for six and a half hours. I did not mean to stream for this long, but hey, it was a good stream regardless. And we got a lot done. Um, I really, really, really wanna get this go live notification stuff out because it's also just something that makes people more aware of Quirk. Uh, again, Quirk is a product that we are building and eventually want to sell. You know, whether it be to a, a company for money or sell it as, you know, uh, as a as a as a, you know, product as a service for people. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we you know, we're going to build it step by step and make it the best that we can. Uh, but this is a big feature. This feature is really important and especially make sure we get it done right the first time so i'm excited about it and i really appreciate you guys hanging out um so yeah check it out i'm going to go ahead and post the vod for today um so that you guys have it as a reference remember 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 the 5th of november uh no remember that uh you know we we will always post our vods first with the youtube or with the twitch embed um, and then about a day or two later, remember, if you go to the YouTube, the second link, our archives, it'll be available for you on the archives as well. Um, and so that's just because we have to wait uh, before we can upload stuff to Twitch or uh, uh, I'm sorry, upload stuff to anywhere else. That's just because of our agreement with Twitch, essentially. Um, OK, cool. So here we go. This is today's agenda. Uh, let me go ahead and see. Oh, I got to put a title. Sorry. Zero four uh 15 2022 and we will say um quirk uh go live notifications uh hmm scheme uh uh setup i guess maybe is really uh or maybe we'll just say uh part two <laughs> i don't know uh part two yeah there we go part two uh, court go live notifications part two. Well, maybe, okay, here we go. Here we go. This is what we'll call it. Uh, creating a quirk worker. I think that makes more sense. Yeah. Cause we really did like create a quirk worker in the first part, uh, and schema schemas. Yeah. Creating a quirk worker in schemas. Yeah. There we go. That's perfect. That's more, that's a better descriptor <laughs> than just like part two. Um, all right, guys, there you go. I've gone ahead and created the document for you. Remember, you are always at any time able to use our wiki to check out uh, any of the stuff that we've done in the past, any of the streams that we've done. If you ever have questions or anything like that, you're more than welcome to join the wiki. Uh, you can easily sign up with your GitHub uh, user account. Uh, and then just add replies, like ask questions, you you know, feel free. Um, but like I said, all of this is available to you guys at any time. So be sure again to check out the wiki. Um, also, if you're new to the channel, thank you guys so much for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. My name is BG. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Alta 4 stream. My uh, wonderful co-host who normally sits behind me is not here right now. His name is Atoda. He plays video games on the stream and I program on the stream. So whether you see me game or me programming uh, or him gaming, I hope to see you whether uh, at either of those shows. Um, but again, if you are new to the channel, be sure to check out our Discord where we basically chat in the off time. If you ever have questions, we have dedicated channels to helping you out with that too. Things like our DevOps channel, programming channel. We have dedicated mods who are in there to help answer questions for you as well. Um, and like I said, we are doing a big YouTube push. This is something new for us. We're really trying to get out there. 
expand and, and really just create more content than just streaming. Uh, I do have our first video out on how to automate your development environment. So if you've ever, you know, been frustrated about having to install things and reinstall them or not know how to install them, uh, check out that video. It's a really good, helpful guide on how you can solve a lot of those problems now and way down the road in the future. Uh, and remember as well, the Alta 4 archives are connected with the wiki. So we do post all of our VODs on the, or on the archives. So again, if you ever want to go back, wa back, watch a view, go to the wiki or go to the archives on YouTube. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, like I said, we play, uh, or we basically code during the week and then we play video games during the weekend. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be uh, hanging out with a Tota. He will be playing games. So I hope to see you guys for that. I'm not too sure on what he will be playing, but I'm sure it will be something and something very fun. Um, let's go ahead and find somebody to raid so I can get out of here and enjoy the rest of my evening and you guys can enjoy some other awesome content. Um, thank you, by the way, for the follows today, all of that stuff. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, let's go raid Anthony. We haven't raided Anthony in a minute. Let's go raid Anthony. So we're going to go raid Anthony. Uh, let's go say hi to Anthony. If you guys have never seen him before, you guys should enjoy the view uh, and the scenery. He's got a he's got a really really cool setup. Uh, you might notice some similar things, maybe a keyboard or some other things, but uh, really cool guy. Works on really cool stuff, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the stream. Enjoy his wonderful stream. Enjoy the rest of your Friday, and I hope to see you tomorrow for gaming. And if I don't see you tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic weekend, and I will see you Monday for more Alta Four streams. All right, guys, peace and love. Enjoy it. Have a good one.